We'll hear about the Food Safety Act of 2009, which would expand the powers of the FDA. Frank Pallone of New Jersey chairs the Commerce Subcommittee on Health. This is under four hours. The meeting of the uh, subcommittee is called to order. And today we are meeting to review the Food Safety Enhancement Act of 2009 discussion draft. I will um, recognize myself for an opening statement uh, initially. This draft discussion or this discussion draft was released by Chairman Waxman, Chairman Emeritus Dingle, Chairman Stupak, Representative DeGette, Representative Sutton and myself early last week. And the draft bills on several bills already introduced in this Congress, including H.R. 759, a bill that I, along with Chairman Dingell and Stupak, introduced earlier this year. The Energy and Commerce Committee has done a lot of work on the issue of food safety. In this subcommittee alone, we have had four hearings on this topic in the last two years. The information we learned during these hearings, as well as during the numerous conversations we have had with stakeholder groups and the FDA, has been incorporated into the draft before us today. And I believe this draft bill represents a strong, well thought out approach to improving the FDA and its food safety activities. We have heard time and again that our current food safety system is broken. It is a system that relies heavily on the FDA rather than placing the responsibility on the manufacturers to ensure the safety of their products. It is a system that is geared towards responding to food outbreaks rather than one that is aimed at preventing them. And this system does not work. And recent outbreaks of E. coli in spinach and salmonella in peppers and peanut butter highlight that fact. Unfortunately, these are not isolated instances. Each year, 76 million Americans get sick due to unsafe food products. Every year, 325,000 individuals will be hospitalized and 5,000 will die from foodborne hazards. It is estimated that the medical costs and lost productivity due to foodborne diseases cost us $44 billion annually, and these illnesses are completely preventable. The good news is that there seems to be agreement that something must be done and, it, and that it must be done quickly. The President has made food safety one of his priorities. He has assembled a food safety working group to come up with principles on this issue. Chairman Waxman, Dingell, Mr. Stupak and I have worked closely with key stakeholders on this discussion draft. And as we move forward with the legislation, we hope to continue those conversations as well as conversations with our counterparts on this committee. The bill we are discussing today will modernize the food safety laws currently in place. It places a strong emphasis on prevention and shifts the responsibility for food safety onto those who actually make the food. It also pro provides the FDA with the necessary resources and enforcement authorities to ensure that all companies are in compliance with the new requirements. This draft bill would require all food manufacturing companies to register annually with the FDA so that the agency has an up-to-date list of all facilities who sell products in the United States. It focuses on prevention by requiring companies to conduct thorough hazard and risk analysis of the products that they are making. It mandates that companies put in place preventive controls to mitigate and minimize those identified hazards, and it requires companies to document all the steps they have taken to implement and verify the controls to ensure they are effectively minimizing hazards. The bill also addresses the shortfalls of our current traceback system by requiring the FDA to establish an electronic interoperable record keeping system that manufacturers would be required to use. This measure will allow the agency to quickly trace the source of an outbreak back to its origin and prevent and minimize the number of individuals affected by a foodborne illness. While shifting responsibility for food safety onto the manufacturers, the draft also recognizes the crucial role the FDA needs to play in this realm. This draft requires the agency to set standards for food safety and hold the food industry accountable for meeting those standards. It provides the FDA with stronger enforcement authorities, such as recall authority and access to records. The bill also increases the inspection frequency for food facilities, requiring that the FDA inspect facilities at an established minimum frequency. Now, we are going to hear today from industry experts about the various provisions in this discussion draft, and I look forward to those conversations. I hope that we can all continue to work in this collaborative manner as we move, move to markup of food safety legislation in this committee. I am very pleased to, to welcome Dr. Margaret Hamburg of the FDA today. She, we had a meeting last week uh, while we were 
doing the energy markup. We were in the back uh, having some conversations, and I was very impressed with her. This is the first time she'll be testifying before this committee, and I thank her for being here. I also want to thank our other witnesses for appearing before us today. Um, I especially want to welcome back uh, Mike Ambrosio. Um, he's, of course, from my home state. Good to see you again, Mike. And I'll now recognize Mr. Deal for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Pallone, and for holding this hearing today. And thanks to our distinguished witnesses who have joined us to review this draft of the Food Safety Enhancement Act of 2009. I look forward to your testimony and to the questions that this uh, panel, uh, that our committee will actually have of the panels. As a resident of the state of Georgia, which has already received a, a focal point uh, focus of the issue of food safety, I know firsthand the perspective that our nation has on the issue of the lack of safeguards and fallback measures that many people expect of a 21st century food supply chain in our country. We all agree food safety is a priority, and I support giving FDA the resources it needs to ensure our nation's food supply remains safe and reliable for American dinner tables across the country. Additionally, implementation of preventive controls, such as hazard analysis and critical point uh, plan included in the draft under discussion is an important step forward in ensuring unsafe food products don't reach uh, store shelves in the first place. As we know, preventing compromised goods from entering the market is the best line of defense to preventing food-related illnesses. I also believe it's important to enhance FDA's ability to conduct on-site inspections of food facilities. The inspection schedule established under the draft does recognize risk pro profiles for food in terms of how frequently facilities should be inspected. But the regimen set forth in the discussion draft fails to address the cost-benefit factor of conducting such frequent inspections and could possibly result in insufficient oversight of certain higher-risk facilities due to time and manpower limitations of our inspectors. It is my hope that our witnesses here today can provide input with regard to an appropriate inspection schedule which achieves the goal of ensuring safe food for the American people without placing an undue burden and strain on the FDA. Uh, which is already challenged under current food safety obligations. This legislation authorizes an annual pay-to-play registration fee for domestic and foreign food facilities of $1,000 to supplement appropriations made by Congress to FDA. In discussion, however, we have not been able to determine from the majority, uh, from the majority or the FDA exactly how much funding is necessary to meet the requirements of this bill. I believe it would be premature to impose significant fees on industry and in turn the American consumers without any reference as to how much funding is actually needed. If the majority remains intent on imposing such registration fees, we must also be certain these fees are limited to cover the activities which are such as a minimal fee paid to the uh, FDA for an application to cover the cost of review and processing. If the goal is to improve food safety, we must ensure that funds are not funneled into other activities that may or may not have anything to do with improving food safety, a situation which I believe could occur under the language of the current proposal. Obviously, these are issues, uh, among many others, that I feel hopefully this committee will be able to address as we move this issue forward. And I look forward to the hearing today and the results uh, that come out of it. I appreciate Chairman Pallone and Chairman Waxman's bipartisan efforts on this issue and look forward to having a product that uh, all the members of this committee can support. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Thank you, Mr. Deal. Mr. Waxman, Chairman Waxman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this uh, subcommittee and our full committee is beginning the process today of passing critically important legislation designed to re revamp our nation's food safety system, the Food Safety Enhancement Act of 2009, and this uh, hearing marks a key milestone. Over the past few years, a series of foodborne disease outbreaks in spinach, peanuts, and peppers, just to name a few, have laid bare some major gaps in our antiquated food safety laws. Oversight work by GAO and by our own Oversight Committee has also helped us understand where we need to focus our efforts to bring our food safety laws into the 21st century. The draft legislation that is the subject of today's hearing is based on the FDA Globalization Act of 2009 introduced by Chairman Emeritus Dingell 
Chairman Pallone and Chairman Stupak, and I commend them for their work on that bill and their continued efforts in shaping this new bill. I also want to recognize the assistance we've received from the Obama administration. We've worked closely with the FDA to identify problems with the current food safety law and to find workable solutions. We will not be passing legislation that sets up the agency to fail. The bill requires that the agency set tough standards, but we've given them the flexibility to prioritize and address the most important risks first. The draft also incorporates helpful suggestions from ranking members Barton and Deal and Representative Shimkus. I believe we can reach a bipartisan agreement and look forward to continuing to work with all the members of this committee. In working with the FDA on this legislation, one thing was abundantly clear. The administration is absolutely committed to overhauling FDA's food safety program. I think we'll all see that commitment today when we hear from Commissioner Hamburg. The recent food outbreaks have exposed glaring holes in FDA's basic food safety authorities. FDA does not have routine access to any records kept by the food manufacturers. FDA cannot require companies to conduct a recall of unsafe foods. The agency can only ask and hope that the company complies. FDA also lacks basic modern enforcement tools like administrative civil monetary penalties. The Food Safety Enhancement Act will give FDA these and other critical authorities. One of the most important changes that will occur under this bill is a focus on prevention. The legislation does not anticipate that FDA alone will protect us from unsafe food. The hallmark of any effective food safety law must be a shared responsibility for food safety oversight between FDA and industry. The uh, act uh, will strike the right balance in this shared responsibility. The bill will require manufacturers to implement preventive systems to stop outbreaks before they occur and will give FDA the tools it needs to hold them accountable if they fail. Under the bill, FDA will also have clear authority to issue and require manufacturers to meet strong, enforceable performance standards to ensure the safety of various types of food. I commend many of those in industry for recognizing the importance of this prevention model and coming to the table to support it. Let me turn briefly to one of the more contentious issues in the bill, the registration fees. I wish we did not have to resort to industry fees to supplement funding for FDA's work. However, when it comes to FDA's food program, the shortfall in revenues is extreme. The FDA's own science board told us that the FDA is so starved for resources that American lives are at risk. We cannot realistically expect appropriations alone to provide sufficient resources to close that gap. The recent outbreaks have also taken a major toll, a major toll on the food industry. In the recent peanut outbreak, Kellogg, Kellogg's alone lost $70 million. Faced with such a dire situation, I think it's reasonable to ask the food industry to chip in. A robust, robust food safety oversight system will provide a great benefit to industry by preventing future outbreaks and rebuilding consumer confidence. Let me be clear, we are not asking industry to cover the entire cost of the bill or any single part of the bill, like the cost of inspections. The bill establishes a set fee of $1,000 per year per facility. FDA is prohibited from increasing that fee in future years except to cover the cost of inflation. The sim bill simply asks industry to chip in its fair share. I also want to address another concern I've heard, the presence of FDA on farms. FDA has always had the authority of foods on farms, and they've generally relied on state and, lo state and local authorities for food safety oversight on farms because they have a strong on-farm presence. Uh, I'm confident that farmers have nothing to fear from this bill. The bill calls for FDA to set its standards through regulation, which means the FDA will go through a public notice and comment uh, process. Our committee is, in the, is busy in the middle of three, uh, this three-month uh, period. Last month, we passed a comprehensive energy and climate change legislation. Soon, we'll take up health care reform. But food safety is so critical that I've carved out time right in between to pass this legislation. 
over the next few weeks, I intend to work with all our committee members, Democratic and Republican, with the FDA, with the affected industries, to achieve a consensus on a food safety bill that we can pass out of committee. We can't afford to wait any longer. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Waxman. Uh, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, we appreciate your having this hearing on this very important issue today. Uh, we all recognize that FDA has many very important responsibilities, and we've known through hearings for the last number of years that the resources available uh, are always in question. But we recognize also that there's a definite need for reform of FDA and and we're delighted that Dr. Hamburg is here with us today to provide testimony and the other panel of witnesses as well. Uh, we look forward to working with the, the majority on this important legislation. And having said that, we do have some significant concerns about some provisions in this legislation, uh, particularly uh, the risk-based inspection portion, uh, particularly that relating to the low-risk facilities. Also, the traceability provisions uh, that I understand, for example, would apply to every convenience store uh, in the country. In addition to that, the recall provisions uh, the, in this legislation, the country of origin uh, provisions, particularly as it relates to the website requirements, and then also, of course, the ability or the, the power that we give to FDA uh, for subpoenas and uh, other uh, instruments to obtain company records. Uh, I think we need to look at those provisions uh, much more closely. But obviously this is an important piece of legislation. We look forward to working with you and listening to the uh, testimony of our witnesses today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is our Chairman Emeritus, Mr. Dingell, and thank you for all you've done on this legislation. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And thank you for holding today's legislative hearing on the Food Safety Enhancement Act of 2009 discussion draft. We've worked together, you and I, with Chairman Stupak and others over the years, and I'm delighted to say that this legislation is ready for, for enactment and is almost old enough to vote. <laughs> I, I want to say that I'm delighted that Chairman Waxman and my good colleagues Ms. DeGette and Mr. Sutton have, and Ms. Sutton have joined us in our work on this bill. We are about to try and fund an agency which is hollow, which does not have either the personnel or the re revenue or the money or the resources which it, which it needs to do its job. And we're about for the first time since 1962, when I was a young member of this body, to try and see to it that it gets its authorities updated to, to deal with the real problems in the world of trade and, the, and in the world marketplace. I'm pleased that we're taking the necessary steps to advance this legislation and address the important issue of food safety. I'm hopeful that we will shortly be doing something with regard to pharmaceuticals. I want to thank the witnesses who've joined us today and look forward to hearing their testimony. And Dr. Hamburg, welcome to the committee. Congratulations on your confirmation. I was encouraged by the administration's early recognition that food safety is a problem that needs to be addressed. The administration food safety working group is a signal to how serious the president considers this issue. And I want to thank you for the way that you and your staff have provided timely and helpful technical advice on the legislation. I want to note that I'm hearing complaints from folks about the, about the fee system. I want to make a note that uh, the only part of food and drug that seems to be working is that which functions under PDUFA and which has the advantage of having industry participating in the funding. I want to note that the industry seems to prospering, be prospering mightily under that particular section and be getting service from food and drug in a proper way, and that seems to be about the only place that the industry is getting protection or the American consumers is, are receiving necessary safety. Um, in 1938, the Congress comprehensively addressed the issue of food safety. Seventy years later, Food and Drug Administration is still trying to protect a larger, increasingly global supply with outdated statutes and inadequate resources. 
as a result of the American consumer confidence in the nation's food supply, in the Food and Drug Administration, and quite frankly, in this body, the Congress, has declined. And American consumers are being forced to pay a heavy price, not only with recall after recall, but also the fact that people are being sickened and killed by unsafe foods and also by pharmaceuticals. And again, I wish to hope that we will commence work on pharmaceuticals as soon as this here is a, this this business is attended to. The Food Safety Enhancement Act is a measured and effective response to the dire situation we are faced with today regarding food safety. Mr. Chairman, the legislation is based on a bill you, Chairman Stupak, and I have introduced earlier this year, and also on a bill that was introduced by me during the past during the past Congress. It includes good technical advice from FDA and valued input from the minority and other stakeholders. And I want to make clear that I am working with the minority to try and resolve their concerns and that we are also working with the industry. And I want to thank my friends in the industry for the goodwill which they have shown in working with us. And I also want to thank Chairman Waxman for his leadership on this point. I look forward to continued deliberations in the hope of producing speedily a bipartisan piece of legislation that will pass the committee and the House, as I've indicated, both in a correct and a speedy fashion. Amongst other things, this bill will prevent safety problems before they occur. It will require manufacturers to implement food safety plans and that identify and protect against foods, uh, food hazards. It will see that Food and Drug has the authority to see to it that good manufacturing practices are adhered to here in the United States and elsewhere, especially in places like China, which is in fact the Wild West in this particular matter. It will advance the, the science of food safety, increase inspection frequency of food facilities, something which can happen more often on dog food manufacturers under the jurisdiction of the Department of Agriculture than it happens with regard to manufacturers who manufacture food products for the safety of our people. It will enhance FDA's ability to trace the origin of tainted food in the event of an outbreak of, or, or foodborne illness. And it should be noted that the Food and Drug Administration and the industry are totally incapable of providing speedy service in this particular. It will enhance the safety of imported food. FDA will be allowed to require that certain foods be certified as meeting U.S. safety standards, and again, to trace. But also, Food and Drug will be able to finally get enough people at the doors of this country to see to it that, that safety is properly enforced and that good manufacturing practices are adhered to around the world for the protection of our people. It will provide strong enforcement tools, including mandatory food recall authority, stronger criminal and civil penalties for bad actors, subpoena authority, and it will increase and strengthen food and drugs detention authority. Finally, and I would argue more importantly, the legislation uh, addresses the very important question of resources of the agency. We will give the agency uh, the authorities it needs, and we would do them a grave disservice if we did not give them the resources they need. The legislation includes a registration fee, which will fund food safety activities at FDA. The revenue from this fee, coupled with additional appropriations, which we hope we can get out of those skin flints at the Appropriations Committee and the Office of Management and Budget, uh, will ensure that food and drug can do its job. For those who argue there's no benefit for the industry to pay a fee for safety activities at Food and Drug, I offer the following. U.S. peanut industry could lose a billion dollars this year because of the outbreak of salmonella that forced the biggest food recall in history. That has just been re replicated by other recalls in the food industry. Tomato industry lost $100 million in sales during the 2008 salmonella outbreak that ultimately was attributed to jalapeno peppers. Spinach growers took a $200 million hit to their industry during a 2006 bag spinach recall. And let us not forget that wonderful Chilean grape scare of 1989, which Food and Drug had neither the authority nor the competence to address. I uh, ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. I have a few other things I'd like to say that I know everybody would want to read. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Dingell. 
The uh, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Hamburg, um, welcome. Um, I, I see Chairman Waxman's left the room. I appreciate his comments about there being some discussions. Uh, I, I do have to admit that the discussions that we've had, when uh, we point out a p point that is correct, they accept when there is a debatable point, Mr. Chairman, there don't there does not seem to be any movement and compromise, so I would encourage more discussions on some of these issues if we really want this to be a, a bipartisan bill. Uh, you know, the other thing I have trouble with is draft hearings. If we're, if we're going to have a legislative hearing, let's have the legislation. This is draft legislation, and if we had the great draft legislation hearing on climate change and then when the bill came before us, it had 300 additional pages in it, and there's fear on our part that uh, this is a sneaky way to say, yeah, we had a legislative hearing, but uh, you really don't have a legislation hearing if you don't have the legislation before you. Um, this is the Democratic majority operandi. We claim a crisis. Only government can be the savior. Government must get bigger, and the middle class pays. And that's the issue here. The, uh, and I was on O&I in the last uh, Congress with Bart Stupak, readily accepting the premise that we have to get inspectors into these facilities. Uh, and we're ready to ad address an issue that's thoughtful and respectful and, and pays for the inspectors and facilities where they're not going into. And it's not like we haven't done anything. Uh, Congress, last Congress, approximately 57 million from the supplemental went to food safety. The House passed a 2009 omnibus appropriated an additional $325 million for the FDA, with $140 million of the $325 million would go for food safety programs. In the President's 2010 budget, he included $1 billion additional dollars to FDA for food safety. So I, there, there is a huge commitment already for massive federal funds to go to food safety. Now we have, as our concern, a, a, a bill, a draft that has, what, $325 million for no explanation, no earmarking, no direction. And that's where a lot of our questions will be today, is why that amount, what justifies that amount, how are we going to assure that it's not going to be used for other purposes, and the like. So. Uh, I would ask the leadership uh, on the other side that if they really want a bipartisan bill, let's get some bipartisan negotiations, sincere negotiations. I would be honored to yield. I'm very fond of the gentleman, as he very, knows, very well knows, and I have great respect for him, and I've been talking, as the gentleman well knows, to the leadership on the minority side, both in the last Congress and in this Congress. I want this legislation to be bipartisan. I don't want the gentleman to be surprised. I would note to my good friend that we have been having hearings after hearings after hearings, not only here, but up in the Oversight Subcommittee, and that during that time I have been continually talking to my good friends on the minority side because I want you to be aboard. This should not be a partisan issue, and when we go to the next step in this process, I will assure the gentleman that most of the changes that will be made will be changes that will be made as a result of discussions with my friends on the minority side. And, and I, I thank the colleague, and I look forward to working with you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next is the gentlewoman from Colorado, Ms. Gett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is the first step towards realizing a long-held dream, not just by me and other members of this committee, but by the millions of Americans who have been concerned about the safety of our food, especially in light of the cascading litany of foodborne illnesses that we've heard about from other members of this committee. Um, we've had a dozen oversight hearings and also legislative hearings. We've had bills dropped by many members of Congress for many years. And I'm so excited under your leadership and the leadership of Chairman Waxman and Chairman Dingell that we're finally on the verge of enacting comprehensive food safety legislation. 
Um, the most important thing about this bill is it would be a definitive statement by this committee and this Congress that food safety is a priority in the United States of America. I want to highlight two of the sections of this bill, and I want to thank you and Mr. Dingle and others and Mr. Stupak for including the provisions of my two bills in this um, draft mark because they're critically important in the future to assuring safe food for everybody. The first one is traceability. As you know, Mr. Chairman, I've been working on these traceability issues for many, many years. And when I first started, people said it couldn't be done. But then as we realized with time, not only can it be done, and, and in slightly different ways within every uh, industry. But if we want to assure this integrity of the food system, it has to be done. That what I fondly call the salsa scare of last year is the perfect example of why. We found people being sickened by salsa and they and and we couldn't figure out why this destroyed pretty much the entire profit of the tomato crop for that whole year because everybody thought it was tomatoes that had the salmonella as it turned out after months and months and months of increased sickness of increased scrutiny we found out that no it wasn't the tomatoes at all it was jalapenos and they were from texas and what i've found out is that we can go to this partic particular sector of the field and find those jalapenos, and we can do it quickly. So traceability is going to be essential, and I look forward to working with my friends on the other side of the aisle to make sure it's not onerous, but I will say this. It is not just in the interest of consumers. It's in the interest of businesses who want to protect their profits to have traceability. Mandatory recall is the second provision of this bill that I've been working on for many years, and I'm so grateful has been um, included. And, and I want to say finally, Mr. Chairman, all of this policy that we talk about, it's all well and good, but I can't help but think about young Jacob, Jacob Hurley, who you might have seen. He was in our last O&I committee hearing. Jacob is from Portland, Oregon, and he got sick from eating peanut butter crackers, his favorite food. When his parents took him to the doctor, they said they finally got him stabilized and he wouldn't eat. So they told the parents, have Jacob just eat what he loves, the peanut butter crackers, the very food that had made him sick in the first place. And the only way we found out about this was because the alert commissioner of, of, um, of consumer protection in Oregon showed up personally at his door and confiscated the peanut butter crackers. We need to fix this. We need to fix it now. And I'm so grateful that we are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. DeGette. Next is the uh, gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Boyer. Ma'am, welcome to the committee. Is it Hamburg or Hamburg? Hamburg. Hamburg. Uh, welcome. And uh, my first reaction to the uh, discussion draft um, is going to lead to some questions that I'll have for you today. It appears that, that Congress, a lot of times we like to pound our chest and, that, and then show to the American people that we're doing something well, but we really end up creating legislation within our own areas of jurisdiction and we create problems. We create things that are multiplicious and redundancies. And uh, if we really wanted to couple substance with the words that I've heard here from some of my colleagues today, we would be working with other committees of jurisdiction we would have a very comprehensive bill. And so I'm going to be asking you questions, ma'am, about uh, uh, clear lines of delineations and responsibilities between USDA and FDA. And uh, who, should, who should really have what responsibility? Or should we as a nation put all food under one agency and work cooperatively with the Ag Committee to do something like that? What we have is a discussion draft that has been cleverly drafted only within the jurisdiction of our own committee. And so what we end up doing is, are we exasperating a problem? And so I'm interested in your, in your leadership. Uh, you're representing a, a, an administration. And so uh, uh, I'm interested in your best counsel to us and your willingness to work with the leaders of other agencies to truly protect the American people. And uh, uh, the other, uh, point I make is that 
Congress, uh, as of late, has been beating up on FDA. I, I would say the FDA, the individuals that I've met and the ones that you have the privilege to lead are some pretty uh, fine and capable and dedicated individuals. Uh, in the last, gosh, 16 years, 17 years that I have been here, whether it's been Republicans in control or Democrats, we continue to pass legislation that leaps more and more responsibilities upon your core missions. Uh, and so here, uh, as your challenge to maintain the gold standards, not only with regard to pharmaceuticals, but also uh, in food, you know, we, we're about to send you uh, legislation for a new mission on tobacco that's counter to your even cultural mission. Yet we're going to continue to make you the whipping post. And so I'm really uh, concerned about the more responsibilities we give you, how much does that um, uh, dilute your responsibilities? And uh, so th those are some of the questions that, that I'm going to be uh, posing to you. And with that, uh, I yield back. Thank you. Um, gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barrow. I thank the chair, and I appreciate the leadership you're showing on this issue. Uh, this is a, a matter of particular interest to me since, as Mr. Deal has already pointed out, two of the most egregious recent cases of tainted food in the food supply originate in my state of Georgia, and I think this bill represents a major step forward in trying to prevent this from happening again. One of the things that's a particular bone of contention with me is that in the last outbreak, um, we got evidence in this committee that the manufacturer had test results which were showing positive presence of, of salmonella, the food was, he was sending out into the marketplace was tainted, and yet they didn't report that to the FDA. It seems to me that what we need to have, in addition to the, the good measures that have been incorporated in this bill, is a, an effective testing regime that has integrity in terms of sampling and integrity in terms of testing. And I think we've got to make it easy for folks to be able to do this, to comply with this, and mandatory for them to report the results of any testing. That's why I think we can pick the bad actors out really early on and perhaps even do a better job of arresting trends at a very early stage, detecting uh, problems before they become serious. Above all, we're going to make sure that we don't bring about the Sergeant Schultz syndrome. You know, he was the comic character in Hogan's Heroes who made a big, big, loud uh, comic demonstration every now and then of not knowing what was inconvenient for him to know. And so we want to make sure that folks don't have the option of opting out or have a disincentive to know what they need to know when they need to know it and that we know what they know when they need to know it. So that's the balance I think we need to strike here. I look forward to working with my colleagues on this as we, as we try and incorporate provisions like that in this bill. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess. Thank the Chairman. Dr. Hamburg, Dr. Sharfstein, uh, good to see you again. Uh, spent uh, some time yesterday out at the FDA's facility, and, and I will echo the comments of Mr. Boyer. You have uh, a wonderful staff that you lead out there. They're obviously very, very dedicated individuals, uh, sometimes working under uh, the adverse conditions that we supply, uh, but certainly I, I know you're very proud of the organization of which you lead, and I believe that pride is justified. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to stipulate to all of the, uh, the difficulties that the Food and Drug Administration is encountering that have already been well documented, and I would ask unanimous consent to insert my entire statement into the record. Let me just concentrate on the aspect that uh, we are now finally, after I don't know how many hearings on this, uh, getting down to, to, to somewhat of the business of acting for the FDA and uh, talking about legislation that would give the Food and Drug Administration some tools, but we're also giving them a time frame, which may prove to be a very difficult time frame for implementation, and we're also putting some additional burden on, on businesses at a time that our economy is in some difficulty. Uh, the legislation proposed will mandate the largest change in food safety in at least two decades, and it will give the entire food industry a compressed time to do so. In a few short months, we will have to turn the current system of paper-based records into an electronic form. Uh, the businesses will have to uh, find the money to register as a food facility and additional user fees if we deem them appropriate in the future, and they'll have to be able to fully trace the food to its place of origin. All of those may be laudable goals, but I'm not certain that what we're proposing as a time frame is, is adequate. And then the Food and Drug Administration itself, in that shortened compression 
press time frame. We'll have to hire enough inspectors to meet the new inspection standards, create unique identifier numbers for every food facility, be they domestic or foreign, set up a new administrative law position for the new criminal and civil penalties, and make certain that each, each center has a food safety plan. All of this instantly demanded in one piece of legislation. I would just point out when we did the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act last year, H.R. 4040, uh, we acted in good faith and we acted with some dispatch, but we created some situations that are absolutely untenable. We've had to go back and try to amend some of those. We've driven some small businesses to the point of bankruptcy. We've uh, created a situation where our resale shops, because they cannot measure the lead standard that we required, are in a position that they don't know whether they can sell the goods that they've been donated or not. So I, I urge us to take every due caution. The law of unintended consequences has a very short turnaround time in, uh, in our current globalized world, and we need to be cognizant of that. And then finally, let me just, you know, a word about bipartisanship. A bill is bipartisan if it is bipartisan at the beginning. And uh, Chairman Dingell, I appreciate the courtesy that you showed me in the last Congress and in, in involving me, in, at least in some of the preliminary discussions of the draft that you were considering. But really, when the draft comes to the Committee for Consideration, it really ought to have had input from both sides. And the fact that there are five or six Democrats on the bill and no Republican. Was there no Republican on this side of the dais with which you could sit down and talk and uh, perhaps get to a point where there could be some general agreement? Uh, We've done this before on other pieces of legislation. We did it on the Food and Drug Reauthorization Act in, in June of 2007. And I frankly do not understand why it is not worth the effort to make these pieces of legislation. We're not talking about points for the next election. We're talking about the regime that will be in place that will ensure the safety of the food for my grandson and Marsha's grandchildren. This is the legacy that we're going to be leaving, and it is too important to be left to partisan politics. And I thank you for the additional time, Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to welcome Peggy Hamburg, an old friend, a brilliant physician, and a superbly qualified person uh, to this uh, committee and, and to her new role as uh, FDA commissioner. I think uh, you bring uh, uh, a lot to this job and will help this committee, which has uh, worked on this issue for the issue of food safety for years and years and years, uh, come to a, a, uh, a thoughtful, careful, uh, helpful uh, decision on the shape of this legislation. So welcome. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm very comfortable with the discussion draft, and I do know that it, rec that it uh, reflects uh, many, many years of input from members. I thought that John Dingell's comment that it's almost old enough to vote was uh, particularly apt. That applies to me, too. Um, and, and I think that uh, coming from a state like California, which is the largest uh, agricultural producer in the country, uh, we ignore food safety at our peril. Um, the vice chairman, uh, Diana DeGette, was chronicling some of the uh, recent outbreaks and how important it is to have uh, traceability and mandatory recall. I agree. Uh, and we could have saved a lot of pain, a lot of cost, and a lot of health problems uh, had we had those measures in place. So I, I just uh, want to conclude by saying that we have an able and willing partner uh, facing us this morning. Um, I think we have an able and willing committee on a bipartisan basis to engage with her, and I'm very eager to see uh, us make progress and to enact legislation close to the committee draft uh, as soon as possible. It's in our national interest, and surely, as we talk about grandchildren, uh, it's in our grandchildren's interest. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to welcome Dr. Tim Jones, who is going to be on our second panel. He's hiding over here in the back. Uh, he must be one of these Baptists from Tennessee. He's going to sit in the back, back row until uh, time for him to come forward. But Dr. Jones is an epidemiologist with the Department of Health in our great state. It does a wonderful job for our state, and I'm absolutely delighted that we're going to be able to hear from him today on the second panel. So, Dr. Jones, thank you for taking the time to come. 
While the draft legislation before us today attempts to improve the safety and the efficacy of the nation's food supply, it appears that there is still a lot of room for improvement. And I'm appreciative that we are having the hearing, and I am hopeful that we're going to be able to work in a bipartisan way on this issue. I appreciate the majority's attempt to improve the country's food safety system, but I think that we all know, especially those of us who are mothers, we know that you can inspect your way to food safety. We know that this legislation is going to have to do more than be uh, reactive. This legislation broadly increases the FDA authority to make it one of the largest federal agencies in the existence. My concern is the growth of bureaucracy and what is going to happen as that bureaucracy grows. What I do think is necessary, and I think it is necessary, that our system be risk-based, that it be preventative and take that approach, and that it effectively target bad actors. It is imperative that resources are focused on issues of high risk and interventions that are most effective. However, this bill places undue burden on small businesses, and they would be harmed by burdensome and expensive provisions that are found in this current draft of this legislation. The FDA has provided no evidence that it has improved its internal processes in order to improve the review of the nation's food supply. This is something we have talked about endlessly in this committee and in hearings. So we're looking forward to having some questions on this. There seems to be, and you haven't proven otherwise, that there are established protocols and lines of communication between different jurisdictions. You have not shown that there are best practices. Indeed, about 13 months ago, I asked for a list of best practices on intra-agency communication and how you are sharing this information, how you are working with your affiliates so that everyone can more easily pinpoint and get to the bottom of problems and bad actors and issues that are coming forward. And yesterday, the FDA announced that they are studying ways to make the agency more transparent. This should have been done before we pass a bill that would give the agency millions of dollars in user fees. And I'm going to yield my time back and submit my full statement for the record and look forward to the questions. Yield back. Thank you. Uh, gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome back, Dr. Hamburg. Um, I know New York has uh, suffered a great loss, but the nation needs you more. I also think it's very fitting that as we've come back to Congress and begin to put the nuts and bolts on our health care reform legislation that the first hearing that this committee is having is with FDA because I believe we'll begin that reform with an overhaul and a better resourcing of the Food and Drug Administration. From the Food Safety Enhancement Act of 2009 that we're looking at in draft today and the Family Smoking Prevention and Control Act of 2009, we're looking at a new FDA and you have the challenge as well as the opportunity to remake this important institution in ways that it better serves the health of the American public while also fostering, guiding, and supporting the bringing of new and better treatments to us as well. I have confidence in a better resourced FDA with more authority and want to, uh, one that's not overly prescriptive. I don't want to be overly prescriptive on what we tell the agency to do, but I hope that we'll be able to allow the agent to agency to do its job based on clear authority, adequate resources, and sound science. In the case of food safety, in this my first few months on this committee, I've really been alarmed to find out what has happened that has put the public, public's health in jeopardy from salmonella to some questions about even the IRB process and several other areas. So we're here to help you create a better, stronger FDA, and this hearing is part of that process. And I thank you and all of the panelists for sharing their experience and expertise with us this morning. Thank you. Gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Dr. Hamburg. Uh, Pennsylvania's number one industry is agriculture, and with that comes a lot of food processing. We're uh, honored to have national companies located in Pennsylvania like Hershey's. We have companies like Welsh's grows a lot of grapes there. 
And more locally in the Pittsburgh area, uh, regional distributors of groceries like Giant Eagle, national distributors of olive products like Delalo's, and of course big names like Del Monte and the corporate headquarters of Heinz, and small companies like Sarah's Chocolates that sells around the country. All of them have talked with us about concerns for this bill and, and uh, certainly are very supportive of making sure we have strong FDA and we're, we want to make sure that happens. Uh, a few questions are raised and I hope I'll be able to remain for part of this hearing, although I have to run to the floor and I apologize for that. I missed some of this, but a number of issues. Making sure that there is no unintended consequences of the bill that leads to increased prices for consumers. Let's uh, work on that, uh, on the registration fee, particularly as it may affect some smaller businesses uh, trying to work. Also, on the regard, with regard to the traceability, we need to be clear what exactly the obligations are for both the processed and fresh food industry. Are we talking about traceability of final product or traceability of every ingredient, uh, ingredient that went into the product? For example, if a local restaurant chain makes cookies or someone else makes cookies, trying to track every single ingredient that comes up with a specific food color dye may be a problem for them and would like to make sure we make that uh, work for the safety of consumers, but not in a way that impairs companies from doing their work. And also, not unintended consequences of giving the FDA's uh, copies of all test results could be less testing. As companies go through lots and lots of tests for products that never make it to market, uh, would it be uh, to test the hundreds of samples each day have to be available or change to the testing of products that are in the marketplace? With regard to the country of origin labeling and disclosure, to list every ingredient on a website will increase the, could increase the cost and resources and not necessarily bring added value. Could there be some general uh, labels such as um, some statement that this product may contain ingredients from one or more of the following countries? Also, how about uh, raising the importance of making sure that all enforcement standards and auditors, or, so all enforcement officers and auditors are well trained and calibrated to work to define audit standard. There is also concern of what happens with a family farm that may sell to local grocery stores. Uh, to what level would they have to comply and would it be that the fees for them would be so high that they certain, simply could not uh, sell any products outside of their own farm store and does that impair some small distributors? How do we help them? Another issue for grocery stores, what if they make packaged food at their stores, uh, such as some value-added ground beef products made in their meat departments? What happens if they mix in other foods at their store? How does that, uh, how does the bill affect them in, in other ways? So certainly in Pennsylvania, we want strong food safety bills. We want ones that protect consumers. We want small businesses to be encouraged and large businesses to be supported, but also encourage new startups. But more than anything else this week, we want the Penguins to win the Stanley Cup, and I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding the hearing today on discussion draft of the food safety legislation. Over the past year or so, there have been several high profile food contamination incidents in the United States involving spinach, cantaloupes, peanut butter, and tomatoes. This committee has diligently investigated all these incidents. Though these hearings on the FDA have clearly shown us that the FDA simply does not have the resources, funding, or manpower technology it needs to protect the American food supply and fulfill its mission. Chairman Dingell, Chairman Blown, and Chairman Stupak have worked tirelessly in this proposed legislation and like to applaud them for their dedication on this issue. I'm hopeful for this hearing and the discussion draft will bring us one step closer to passing food safety legislation out of the House. I have a brief chance to review the legislation. I'd like to briefly discuss a couple of issues that concern me. Discussion draft allows for food imported to be inspected by third party accredited labs to conduct sample analysis. I support the provision, but I'd like to see an investment in construction of FDA labs. The Port of Houston is the largest port in the U.S. in terms of foreign tonnage, and a large portion of that is related to our energy industry, but the port imported 606 thousand tons of imported food in 2007. The Port of Houston does not have an FDA lab and surprisingly no FDA, la FDA lab in Texas even though we share the longest border with Mexico. I have yet to understand why Texas with its level of trade and southern border with Mexico does not have an FDA lab. In fact, there are over 300 ports of entry in the United States and only 13 ports actually have FDA labs. I hope my colleague from Arkansas will forgive me but the closest FDA lab in Houston to Houston, the entire state of Texas located in Arkansas. Houston isn't the only import area in Texas. Cities like Laredo, Texas, it's the largest or one of the largest land uh, uh, locked ports of entry in the world, 
imports from Mexico, literally um, trailers, uh, thousands of trailers on a weekly basis. It seems unwise and frankly unsafe to have the FDA lab for the entire state of Texas located hundreds of miles away in another state. The location of the FDA labs throughout the U.S. needs to be evaluated and reports should be submitted to Congress on where the FDA labs are located where they are most needed. The discussion draft allows FDA to assess the current FDA lab locations and to relocate labs as necessary. I'd like to hear from the FDA on whether they have any plans to evaluate current lab FDA lab locations. Congress also needs the allocated funds to the building of more FDA labs. I was pleased to see the President's budget. The allocation of funds to establish three high volume, uh, volume FDA labs. If we want FDA to truly to ensure the safety of our food supply, we need to build more FDA labs in areas where food imports are arriving, such as Houston, so the FDA can quickly and accurately test our food imports and ensure food, food safety. Uh, again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Look forward to hearing our witnesses, and thank you again for uh, thank our uh, new FDA director for appearing for the committee. Thank you, Mr. Green. Um, our ranking member, Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. We uh, support there being a uh, legislative hearing and hearing on the, on food safety. Uh, we think it's time to address this problem in a bipartisan fashion, if at all possible. Uh, we do think it's important that we try to get it right, if at all if at all possible. Um, we understand that. Um, it's your wish and the full committee chairman's wish and uh, former chairman Dingell's wish to move with uh, legislation sometime this month. Republicans are ready to help if we can't agree on a bill that provides the FDA with the tools that it needs to ensure the safety of our food supply. But we will not support new blanket authorities that are designed merely to empower the bureaucracy. Nearly everybody says that, quote, we cannot inspect our way to food safety, end quote. We need systems that reliably prevent sickness by applying resources in those places that are most susceptible to contamination. The draft before us proposes several areas that strengthen prevention of food illness outbreaks, such as requiring all manufacturers to have food safety plans and also the creation of appropriate produce standards. These ideas make sense and have near universal support. We are concerned, however, that parts of the draft add more weight than quality to the regulations and, in our opinion, provide too much discretion to the FDA without any corresponding food safety benefit. For example, <coughs> country of origin labeling is not about food safety. It's a practical matter. It will simply increase the cost of groceries at the store. We know this because expert after expert has testified at the committee that this provision has absolutely no effect on safety. There are several other specific concerns with the draft, including the level and the scope of the registration fees. I will say that uh, the registration fees are, are less in this draft than they have been in some previous drafts, so that I can at least say that we're moving in the right direction. Having said that, uh, it doesn't appear, I mean, it does appear that uh, the majority simply wants 300 to 400 million dollars in additional um, uh, funds for the FDA, uh, and we can't see that uh, that there's any clear purpose for that amount of funding. Having said that, we look forward uh, to the hearings, and um, if we can work on some of these problems, we're prepared to uh, be positively engaged in the markup that. Uh, comes after the hearings. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, we yield back. Thank you, Mr. Barton. The gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for um, holding this hearing on this extraordinarily important issue. I um, want to extend my appreciation to the sponsor of this bill and all of those who for so long have been fighting the fight to fix our food safety system and make sure that the food that is on the table uh, to feed our families is safe for their consumption and that which goes to them goes with them to school. Um, they can fear not that it will be safe for their children to eat. Um, ch um, Chairman Emeritus Dingell, I thank you very much for your long effort in improving our, our food safety network, along with Representative Dingell, Representative Stupak, 
and others throughout uh, on both sides of the aisle um, and look forward to working with you. As you may know, the very first bill that I introduced in the House, I believe, was uh, a bill to call for mandatory recall authority uh, for the FDA. And there's a reason for that. I mean, we have seen these problems arise again and again and again within our food safety network. And the American people, I think, would have been shocked, as I was, to learn that our government did not have the authority to issue a mandatory recall when it became apparent that it was necessary. Uh, Ohio has suffered the effects of problems with our food safety system. Most recently, the salmonella outbreak uh, has claimed lives and harmed many throughout the, uh, the Buckeye State. And it's critical that we are moving forward with a comprehensive bill to finally address and ensure the safety of America's tables and uh, our system. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the hearing and congratulations, Commissioner, for your your uh, confirmation. I look forward to working with you. Some difficult issues ahead. I'm glad this committee is focused on food safety. I think we can all agree that the FDA needs more resources to protect our food supply and strengthen public health. I am concerned, however, that this might be a ready, uh, shoot, aim event. We just passed a, a fairly onerous bill uh, and, and added a lot of authority to the FDA that had a huge loophole in it that allowed tobacco regulation to be borrowed from the general fund of the FDA. So you have this hole of millions and millions of dollars of which you're going to have to try to apply to new thousands and thousands of new regulators at the same time we're trying to improve food safety. And I can't think of anything more important than our food supply. I mean, I can't. I, my, my hat's off to you, Commissioner, on the challenge of which you've just accepted. As we all know, the FDA is currently unable to inspect a majority of the nation's food facilities. Worse, Many high-risk facilities have gone without inspection and oversight at all. Over the last two years, we've seen the impact of this failure, numerous, numerous salmonella and E. coli outbreaks which have sickened thousands and even led to death. I hope that this bill can eventually be a bipartisan bill. Uh, however, many of the concerns that we have uh, expressed uh, have not been addressed, and we have not had the opportunity uh, to sit down and have a discussion before this bill has come before the committee. And I think that's horribly unfortunate when you're talking about food safety and food safety issues. The user fees in this draft are concerning to me. Uh, as written, the bill would require $1,000 in a registration fee per food facility, but these funds totaling about $375 million, which will be passed along to consumers, which are regular families trying to pay their bills already, uh, uh, it, it, there's nothing in there that dedicates this to new inspections. So we've come up with a new tax regiment that doesn't benefit the FDA in getting it to the place where you need it most, which is inspectors for uh, food facilities and food supply. Makes no sense to me, and that's something we absolutely have to change in this bill. Or, uh, Madam Commissioner, you're going to be looking at a very tough hole to fill again. There's nothing in here that tells the appropriators where to put that money so that you can best use it to accomplish the mission of which this bill will tell you it has to do without telling you where the money's coming from. This is, that's almost dangerous when you think about this plus the FDA Tobacco Regulation Authority that allows them to take your money for food supply inspections and drug approval and use it for hiring new regulators for tobacco. That's a real problem that we need to fix, not only in this bill, at least I hope we can. Uh, if food producers are required to pay the, this new tax, they should absolutely have the certainty uh, of that the funds are going to be used for food safety inspections. I think that's common sense. I think we could all agree on it. I would hope to work with the majority to get that taken care of. In addition, the draft's inspection schedule seems almost impossible to achieve. Uh, today, I hope, the uh, uh, Commissioner, that uh, you can shed some light uh, on what a practical risk-based inspection schedule should, should look like. And I hope you can cover that today uh, in your statement and through questions. Uh, I also, also have several other concerns, the new broad recall authorities. I think recall authority is important, but how it's done is incredibly important. Uh, an expansive new civil penalty regime, new labeling requirements that seem, don't seem to have anything to do with food safety. Again, I think all of these issues we can address if we work together in a bipartisan manner uh, and I think come around something that we all believe needs to happen, and that's more resources for food inspection and food uh, safety regimes uh, that the FDA 
has a primary responsibility for. I look forward to working with you, uh, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for this, I think, all-important uh, hearing. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, gentlewoman from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the fact that you're holding today's hearing and also want to join my colleagues in commending you and uh, Chairman Stupak and Chairman Emeritus Dingell and Chairman Waxman for putting this very important uh, discussion draft uh, before us that addresses very serious challenges that we face with respect to food safety. Um, before I begin my remarks, I would like to submit for the record um, written testimony from the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection in the state of Wisconsin. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Food safety is an issue of great concern to me and my constituents. Approximately one in four uh, people in this country are affected or, or sickened by foodborne disease each year. As Americans, we rely on government to keep us safe, and as government, we have fallen down on the job. As we consider this draft legislation, I know that our goal is to empower the FDA to prevent food contamination incidents before they occur. I hope that we do so with appropriate and sufficient resources, but also with precise coordination between other federal agencies, the states, and the private sector. Currently, with its limited resources, the FDA focuses its inspections on large manufacturers engaged in interstate commerce, and it leaves much of the frontline work to the states. This bill creates a risk-based inspection system that significantly increases the frequency of inspections. I want to make sure that we are not duplicating efforts and that we can empower states to perform their work on the ground with logistical and financial support. I urge the FDA to use this legislation to create a stronger, more integrated food safety system that leverages state and local resources. Another, as a, as another result of limited resources, FDA relies on many private sector firms to conduct food safety tasting, testing, testing on a contractual basis. I'm pleased that the discussion draft includes a provision that would allow a laboratory accreditation process facilitating the FDA's use of third-party laboratories to perform testing. And I want to make sure that the conflict of, or of interest language in the bill does not prevent some of the most experienced laboratories from maintaining their strong partnership with the FDA moving forward. I look forward to hearing your testimony, Dr. Hamburg, and uh, that of the other witnesses today. And I thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for this hearing. Thank you. Gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gangry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, public health officials estimate that 76 million people become sick, 325,000 are actually hospitalized, and 5,000 die each year from foodborne illnesses caused by contamination. Incidents like those in my own home state of Georgia, where the actions of a few bad actors and a breakdown in effective government oversight sickened more than 677 people in 45 states and caused at least nine deaths underscores the need for action. I agree with my colleagues that more needs to be done to ensure that the food products American consumers buy are safe. Additionally, I support the efforts of this committee as it reviews ways to streamline and improve the food inspection system in this country. Mr. Chairman, I hope that these hearings will continue to allow us the opportunity to reflect on the breakdowns in our current system, as well as the appropriate solutions to safeguard the health and welfare of all Americans. Uh, Madam Commissioner, I commend you for your recent appointment. Look forward to hearing from you and from the next uh, panel of witnesses. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Thank you. Gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Braley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Dr. Hamburg. I don't think anyone sitting over here uh, has anything but good wishes for you and the enormous challenges you face, and we wish you well and look forward to many fruitful and productive conversations with you. Um, as Vice Chairman of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, I've been very involved in the hearings that we've had up to this point on this important subject, and I'm glad to see us finally getting to the point of considering legislation that's so critical to the health and safety of Americans. 
Throughout this process, we have seen examples of both good and bad actors in the food industry. Some companies like Nestle USA set the standard with proactive food safety audits and showed us what can happen when companies do the right thing in reaching out and doing their own investigations. On the other hand, we heard extensively about Peanut Corporation of America and its unsanitary and unsafe conditions and about its action to misrepresent the results of audits that were done which put people at risk and cost people their lives. That is why we are here today to talk about what we can do to improve the current state of the uh, situation. This Food Safety Enhancement Act will solve many of the FDA's current limitations, and I am glad that it requires increased inspections of food facilities, tiered inspection systems that distinguish between high-risk facilities, low-risk facilities and warehouses, and I also support the provisions to ensure the safety of imported foods, which is something I fought for since introduction of the Fresh Produce Safety Act last Congress. Also very importantly, I am very proud that this bill has strong whistleblower protections and I believe that it will help keep America's food supply safe. Many might consider some of the provisions in this bill burdensome. However, it is important to look at the opportunity cost of failing to take action to improve food safety. In our March 19 oversight hearing, I asked David Mackey, who is the CEO of Kellogg, how much the PCA salmonella outbreak had cost his company, and he replied between $65 and $70 million. The legislation before us today might have prevented that outbreak and saved those costs. Most, most important, however, is what we owe to the families of this country who have been injured or killed by unsafe foods and the desire to take real action to keep our food supply safe. In 2006, a graduate of Dubuque Wallard High School in my district, a marathon runner named Jim, Jill Cole, contracted E. coli from a spinach salad that she ate. After 17 days in the hospital, she was released with just 8 percent of her kidney function, and she now has to see a doctor twice a year to monitor her kidneys. Jill and all other Americans should be able to have faith that their food is safe, and we are here today to try to restore that faith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Dr. Hamburg. We are so excited to see you in this position, and we look forward to your testimony on the proposed uh, legislation. The, um, the comment has been made a couple of times that we can inspect our way to food safety, and that may be true, but we cannot inspect our way to food danger, which I think has been, uh, unfortunately, the hallmark of of what's happened in recent past. And so this bill that's proposed is going to put so much more emphasis on monitoring uh, and inspection on the front end, which is going to make a tremendous difference. When you look at the provisions that are contained in this proposed legislation, so many of them go under the heading of no-brainers. In other words, these are things that, that the average citizen would imagine are already in place, and I think would be surprised to learn are not in place. And so there's so much about this bill that represents sort of the pent up needs um, and concerns of the American public that we need uh, to address. Uh, on the economics, and there's been a, a fair amount of discussion about that already just in the opening statements, uh, the better we do on the front end, of course, with monitoring and inspection, the less costs we're going to have on the back end, both in terms of FDA needing to scramble to deal with outbreaks of foodborne illness, but also to save costs to businesses of not having uh, to deal with the effects of that. And I think that those save costs will far outweigh uh, the investment that we put in uh, on the front end and certainly justify many of the measures that are contained um, in this bill. So we look forward to your testimony. Welcome and good luck to you. <laughs> Yield back my time. Gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I look forward to uh, Dr. Hamburg's testimony and uh, members of the other panels. I, I think what we're talking about here today is setting very high but very reasonable expectations for uh, what we can do out of the FDA. And I think that uh, if that's our goal, we can get a product that uh, both parties can be uh, proud of. Um, as the former chair of Connecticut's uh, Public Health Committee, um, I think I speak for a lot of 
uh, state policymakers in our feeling of helplessness over the uh, past five to ten years especially. And I think you're going to find, as this committee will find, a lot of allies uh, in state public health networks. Uh, they're going to be very supportive uh, of this transformation that you're undergoing uh, to try to assist in their efforts, um, which have been very difficult uh, over the past several years. Um, uh, lastly, Mr. Chairman, I'm very appreciative to you and to uh, Mr. Dingell and others uh, for including in this bill several aspects of um, the work that my colleague in Connecticut, um, uh, Chairwoman of the Agricultural uh, Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee, Rosa DeLauro, she's been working as a tireless advocate on this issue and um, parts of this bill relative to the inspection frequency for uh, the riskiest uh, foods out there, enforceable performance standards for food bo foodborne pathogens um, uh, are parts of, uh, uh, of her efforts incorporated into the underlying bill. Uh, and I uh, appreciate uh, you paying attention to, uh, uh, to her work here as well. I uh, look forward to your testimony. Thank you for being here. Yield back. Thank you. Gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and kudos as well to, to Rosa DeLauro and uh, Bart Stupak and John Dingell, our colleagues here that have worked for many years to improve food safety in America. And welcome to Dr. Hamburg. Uh, based upon your background, obviously, you enjoy a challenge, and uh, the food safety is an important challenge uh, for our country. Of all the issues we deal with in this subcommittee, uh, food is the most ubiquitous. It is relevant to all Americans. Uh, I wanted to remind my colleagues that the Government Accountability Office, remember, keeps that very short list of major government problems that require broad transformation before uh, they can ever hope to be effective. The list, called the High Risk Series, includes noto notorious government failures such as the financial regulatory system, which let, failed to prevent the largest financial collapse in generations. It includes the implementation of the Homeland Security Department, uh, which has been plagued from the beginning by cost overruns. Uh, and no surprise, it also includes federal oversight of food safety. Uh, and here's an example from last year that, that really hurt. Uh, in my home state of Florida. Tomatoes last year from Florida were blamed for a nationwide salmonella outbreak that was eventually traced to jalapeno and serrano peppers from Mexico. In the meantime, FDA intimated uh, at the time not to consume Florida tomatoes, and that cost our state and agricultural uh, producers and hardworking folks over $100 million. All of the time and effort spent hinting and, and suggesting that Florida tomatoes uh, were the problem only served to delay the solution to the real problem and allow more Americans to get sick. Uh, our committee understands the problem. The, this committee has held several hearings and we understand that we must act expeditiously. Uh, part of the problem lies in the lack of federal authority to effectively respond to a crisis. When FDA does not have incontrovertible proof of a specific food contamination, it cannot today issue a mandatory recall. Instead, it must rely on corporations to voluntarily choose to pull inventory from the shelves. The FDA does not even have the ability to assess civil penalties. Uh, this legislation before us gives the FDA that long overdue enforcement authority. The, the problems facing food safety and oversight are legion and they are difficult, but they are not insurmountable. And I am confident that we will move the Food Safety Enhancement Act of 2009 uh, quickly and provide American consumers with a safe, transparent, and reliable food supply. I yield back my time. Thank you. Gentlewoman from California, Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this uh, important hearing on the um, Food Safety Enhancement Act of 2009. And uh, I want to extend the warmest welcome and congratulations to Dr. Hamburg. Um, she is a woman of um, exceptional talent, uh, high intellect, um, a person with uh, great character. Um, and someone that has given much to our country already and comes from uh, one of the most uh, outstanding families, I think, in our country. I am so, you can tell how elated I am 
uh, that the President chose uh, so wisely in appointing you as uh, FDA Commissioner, and we all look forward to working with you. To the extent that you succeed, the country is going to succeed. I also think that, uh, that your tenure um, can be and will be the mark where uh, the FDA uh, uh, returns to being uh, the gold standard uh, in terms of a public agency. Uh, the American people believe in the FDA. They want the FDA to succeed because what you do, they can't do for themselves. And the decisions that are taken um, uh, can be the difference between life and death. That's how profound the decisions are. So um, uh, I can't tell you how thrilled I am that um, you are the one. Um, uh, I'm pleased that the legislation that we're considering is going to improve the uh, traceability of food uh, because when tainted food is discovered, it's critical that we know where it has come from, uh, where it's gone, and what stores it's sold in. Um, if sales are limited to a certain area, targeted recall uh, could take place, which would be more effective for consumers and businesses. And I'm also pleased to see that uh, the mandatory country of origin uh, labeling for food is included in the bill. I think in today's environment, uh, this is really essential information for consumers to know where their food comes from. Uh, this is a long and complex bill. And uh, I too, uh, along with my colleague, uh, Mr. Murphy from Connecticut, really want to salute those that have uh, uh, worked on this issue. Uh, Rosa DeLauro has just been tireless and uh, uh, you know that she brings uh, uh, passion and intellect to what she does. And so some of uh, uh, the ideas from her legislation are embedded in this. I look forward to our conversation. I, I, I hope that what we are asking the FDA to do, that you are really up to it. I, I think that we've lived on fees for a long time. And I, I still have questions and would like to know directly from you whether you really think you're going to have the resources that are necessary to do this. Um, because if you don't, then the print of the legislation or law will be wonderful to read, like some constitutions around the world that are absolutely magnificent, but they're not worth the paper that they're written on. Um, we have uh, fallen off the edge of a cliff in terms of what's coming into the country and what's happened to the American people. We have to get this right this time. And um, uh, some think that uh, there should be a standalone food inspection agency. Uh, can the FDA actually do all of this? Do you have the resources for it? Um, I mean, if there's pizza that has pepperoni on it versus pizza that doesn't have any meat on it, should there be a split jurisdiction between agriculture and the FDA in terms of inspection? Uh, I think the more uh, splits there are, uh, the more um, uh, that there's more of an opportunity for things to fall through the cracks. I may be entirely wrong, but I, I still have some questions. I don't think this is a perfect piece of legislation, but I'm sure glad that we're considering the issue. Uh, so uh, I wish you nothing but the best. I have great, great confidence and respect for you, and I'm very proud that the President chose to pick the best in the country for this job. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations, Dr. Hamburg. I uh, come to this issue with a lot of history and also this particular issue with a lot of emotion. Um, my good friend Nancy Donnelly, whose uh, only child, Alex, was uh, lost beca because of uh, eating e coli, a hamburger with E. coli and then dedicated her life to creating an organization, Safe Tables Our Priority, um, has worked tirelessly for, for food safety. And every time, year after year, we have people coming before us telling these devastating stories. And every time we say we're going to do something so that never happens again, and yet it does. In February, we heard testimony from Peter Hurley, whose young son was made ill by eating Austin peanut butter crackers. They were found in millions of, of homes. And we were all shocked 
by documents presented at that hearing that showed that the Peanut Corporation of America knew that their products were tainted and yet released them into the food supply anyway. So the discussion draft that's before us includes provisions that will seriously fill the many fill many of the gaps in our current food food system. I wanted to just mention a, a couple of uh, things that I think um, ought to be considered for review. There's just a brief mention in the in the bill dealing with the issue of antibiotic resistant pathogens and the extent to which antibiotics that are used in livestock contributes to this resistance. We don't necessarily always think about this as, as food safety, but I think it's a truly important issue. We've looked H1N1, I know it was a virus, but, but nonetheless everybody's waiting for that uh, kind of uh, plague that we don't have the uh, cure for because, partly because of antibiotic resistance. Second, I believe that companies who have positive test results for possibly dangerous contaminants should be required to report those results to the FDA. Um, we heard how PCA, no, nobody knew about it, and I, I think there are many other examples. It's a question on how the FDA effectively can ensure the, food, the safety of our food if we don't even know where there might be a problem. And finally, I believe the collecting and de disseminating of information about food safety and foodborne illness to consumers is a critical component of any food safety plan. I am encouraged by the provisions of the bill, but I think there may be more that we can do to ensure that Americans are adequately in informed. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I believe that uh, completes our, our members' opening statements. Um, so we'll now turn to our witness. Um, and let me say, uh, Dr. Hamburg, I appreciate your being here. I want to welcome you. Um, we have, as you know, five-minute opening statements become part of the record, and then you may get some questions afterwards uh, from members of the committee. So thank you, and if you'd begin. Chairman Pallone and members of the subcommittee, I'm Dr. Margaret Hamburg, Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the urgent need for reform of our nation's food safety system. I commend you, Chairman Axman, Chairman Stupak, Chairman Emeritus Dingell, and other members of the committee and your staffs for your leadership and hard work in developing this draft legislation. The food safety bill under consideration represents significant reforms needed to modernize our food safety system. I am honored to have been chosen by President Obama to lead this great agency, and, am, and I am inspired by the President's personal commitment to improving food safety, including the progress being made by his food safety working group. The President has backed up his commitment with resources, proposing historic increases in funding for FDA's food safety efforts. I also appreciate the support of Secretary Kathleen Sebelius and the Department of Health and Human Services and of Secretary Tom Vilsack and the U.S. Department of Agriculture for major progress on food safety. In addition, a coalition of consumer groups is fighting for improvements in the food safety system so that more families do not have to suffer tragic consequences from foodborne disease. Major sectors in the food industry also support and are advocating for fundamental change. But even with all this support and momentum, our efforts will fall short unless Congress modernizes food safety laws to deal with the challenges of the 21st century. That's why this hearing is so important. From the perspective of FDA, there are three key questions to ask about food safety legislation. First, does the legislation support a new system focused on prevention? Second, does the legislation provide FDA the legal tools necessary to match its existing and new food safety responsibilities? And third, does the legislation provide or anticipate resources for the agency to match its responsibilities. To comment on the discussion draft, let me address each of these issues in turn. For the first, does the legislation support a new food safety system focused on prevention? 
the draft legislation would indeed transform our nation's approach to food safety from responding to outbreaks to preventing them. It would do so by requiring and then holding companies accountable for understanding the risks to the food supply under their control and then implementing effective measures to prevent contamination. Does the legislation provide FDA the legal tools necessary to match its existing and new responsibilities? In a new food safety system, FDA has the fundamental responsibility of overseeing and verifying the implementation of preventive measures by hundreds of thousands of companies. The agency also retains the existing critical role of protecting the public during an outbreak. FDA needs new legal authorities to be able to succeed in these roles and protect the public health. This legislation would provide these critical tools. My written testimony provides several examples, but I'd like to highlight one of the most important new authorities now. Section 106 provides FDA with explicit authority to access food records during routine inspections, thereby addressing one of the most significant gaps in FDA's existing authority. The authority provided in this provision is essential to enable FDA to identify problems and require corrections before people become ill. It also enables the agency to verify during routine inspections that firms are maintaining proper distribution records. Records access and record keeping by all persons in the distribution chain are the key mechanisms of providing regulators with information on plant operations, product safety, and product distribution. Such information is necessary to verify compliance and to identify problems. Lastly, does the legislation provide or anticipate resources for the agency to match its existing and new responsibilities? The draft legislation makes an important investment in the resources needed for major progress. After all, FDA must have the resources necessary to meet its responsibilities. Otherwise, the public will not benefit from the promise of a modern food safety system, and the agency will fail to meet the expectations of the President, Congress, and the public. The bill authorizes three fees that are also requested in the President's fiscal year 2010 budget. One of these is in Section 101, which provides for a registration fee. This fee is of critical importance to enable the agency to improve and expand its food safety activities, including to increase its inspection coverage of the approximately 378,000 registered facilities and to enhance its other food safety activities. Section 105 proposes a rigorous inspection schedule for food facilities. These requirements start 18 months after the enactment. To meet these requirements, Section 105 allows the agency to use inspections conducted by inspectors from recognized state, local, other federal agencies, and foreign government officials. FDA would like to raise three issues about Section 105. First, the amount of resources required to achieve these inspection goals would far exceed even the historic increases in the President's fiscal year 2010 budget. Moreover, it would be difficult, if not impossible, for FDA to hire and train thousands of additional staff so quickly, even while relying on inspections by state, local, and other federal and foreign government officials. As a result, FDA encourages the committee to modify this section to take into account the operational and resource challenges involved. Second, as we develop a new food safety system, FDA will gain better information to guide the agency's approach to inspection and oversight. We will understand where we must inspect more frequently because of the high risk of certain foods, facilities, and processes, and understand where we can protect public health without conducting inspections as frequently. As a result, FDA would support flexibility to modify the inspection requirements based on the best available data on risk. Third, Section 105 could do more to provide flexibility to FDA in meeting the inspection challenge. The draft legislation allows the agency to rely on inspections by other federal agencies as well as by state, local, and foreign governments. 
An additional promising mechanism for international inspections is certification by accredited third parties. FDA would like the flexibility to explore the use of such an accreditation system and audit the performance of accredited third parties. With strong standards and robust oversight by FDA, this approach could help address the oversight challenge posed by the more than 220,000 registered foreign facilities exporting to the United States. This is a historic moment for food safety in the United States, a moment for FDA and its sister agencies in the federal government to rise to the challenge of the 21st century. Success means fewer hospitalizations and deaths, fewer devastating recalls, and greater health for the American people. The draft legislation is a major step in the right direction. I commend the committee for its leadership and on behalf of the hundreds of dedicated staff devoted to food safety at FDA, I look forward to assisting with the legislative process. I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Hamburg. We'll have a series of questions now from the members. Uh, each of them gets five minutes, and I'll start with myself. Um, under the bill, all facilities, both domestic and foreign, seeking to market food in the U.S. must register each year and provide certain information about the facility to the FDA. If the facility is not registered, it is illegal to market food from that facility in the U.S., and in order to register, each facility would be required to pay $1,000 per year as a registration fee. Now, my understanding is there was, in 2002, there was bioterrorism legislation, and under that uh, legislation, food facilities were required to register but there was no requirement to update that registration. So my questions re reference that, that registration under the 2002 bill. Has that system resulted in problems in terms of FDA's ability to accurately account for all facilities selling food in the U.S.? And maybe you can tell us what problems exist. And then the second part is, do you believe that linking a fee to the requirement to register would help address whatever problems exist under this system that dates back to that 2002 uh, bioterrorism legislation. Thank you. I think it is clear based on the experience since the Bioterrorism Act in 2002 that we do need the extended authorities that would be offered in this bill. Uh, we know that when a facility registers once but doesn't have to register again, uh, that it, it, it does create problems in terms of our ability uh, to fully understand um, the nature of the, the food-related activities in that facility. The um, Peanut Corporation of America, I think, is, is one good example where when they first registered, they weren't actually making peanut butter, and then they, they added that um, to their activities. With, with annual registration, we would have a much better um, uh, record and understanding of the activities, and it would provide us with the tools to be more responsible in our oversight and in our inspections. With respect to the issue of fees, I think it's a very important component of any food safety plan that Congress would enact. We absolutely need to have the resources to do our job. I understand that fees represent a burden on companies, and I, I wish that um, we were not dependent on that mechanism um, in, in all cases, but I do think that that fee is an investment in a robust and effective food safety system. That fee will go to enable the FDA uh, to provide certain specific services and put in place um, the broad and modernized food safety system that American consumers expect and need. All right. Now, you let, let me go back to this fee, because in the President's budget, he asks uh, $75 million in registration and reinspection fees. So obviously, the administration has already shown support for the concept of a, of a registration fee for, for food facilities in the budget. However, in our bill, with its $1,000 per facility fee, we would generate much more than the $75 million that's in the President's budget. So I wanted you to explain, if you could, what was contemplated in the President's budget request of the $75 million. Did that request seek to address the new authorities provided in this bill? Well, the, the President's budget request 
uh, was, of course, put together before uh, the specifics of this proposed legislation was put forward. So it wasn't addressing all of the specific requirements laid out in this bill, um, importantly, including the inspection schedule. Um, in my uh, written testimony, there's an appendix that actually lays out um, some of the food safety highlights in the President's bill and um, some of the targeted areas for that $75 million uh, increase in, in the budget. Uh, it was to include um, many elements that are a part of this legislation, increased inspections, but not to the degree that this legislation would call for, um, the implementation of preventive controls, uh, strengthened laboratory testing, a stronger integration of FDA and federal food safety efforts with the state and local activities, which is ultimately very, very essential to well, that, that. that. You know, I know that the bill allows these fees to be applied towards a, a broad array of FDA's food safety activities. You know, in other words, it allows the fees to be used to boost FDA's ability to develop standards like performance standards or preventive controls. Do you agree that the fees should be applied towards all these activities that, that we mentioned in the bill? I think we want a robust, comprehensive program, and, and those fees sh should be applied to putting in place that suite of activities. The preventive controls are direct, directly related to um, what companies must, must do under the new legislation, and I think it's, it's very appropriate that, that the fees cover um, that aspect. Uh, for example, the inspections obviously are directly related very important that the fees cover that aspect um, and many other aspects of, of the, the portfolio of activities outlined in the legislation really are essential to what needs to be done to protect consumers and ultimately to protect the food industry so that uh, the, the public and consumers can be assured that the products are safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Deal? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Mr. Whitfield. Thank you. Mr. Deal had to leave. Dr. Hanberg, as you probably know, uh, Senator Kennedy and Durbin and Burr and Greg have introduced a food safety bill on the Senate side. And it, has the administration endorsed that bill, or has it endorsed this bill, or has it endorsed any bill? You know, I have to be honest that I have not. I've only been in, on the job seven days, and I have been focused on your piece of legislation. Okay. And um, so at, 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 I'd be happy at a later time to, to, to um, discuss in more detail the bill on the Senate side. But, but as far as you know, the administration has not endorsed the, either bill. I, 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 I don't believe so. Okay. Well, the reason I brought that up, there are some significant differences in the Senate bill and the House bill. And one area of difference relates to uh, recall authority of the FDA. And uh, under this bill, the, the FDA would have the authority for recall if an article of, of food may, may cause adverse health consequences. That would be the legal standard, may cause. But in the Senate bill, it, it says that there must be a reasonable probability of serious adverse health consequences or death. So those standards are significantly different. And I was just ask you, uh, since you're now going to be responsible for this, uh, that first standard that's in this bill seems so general and so uh, nebulous in a way. Does that bother you, or do you, do you, don't you think it would be better uh, to have a more precise identified standard for recall? Well, I certainly understand the concern that you're raising, and I think that there may be opportunities for some wordsmithing. Uh, certainly, we would never seek to recall a product without, um, you know, some reasonable expectation that there was uh, serious adverse consequences and harm related to that product. A recall is, is no small issue, both yeah. um, 
in terms of resources and efforts on the part of the FDA and also its implications on, on industry and consumers who want access to those, those products. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's an area that we'd, we'd like to work with you on for language that we wouldn't want it to be too overwhelmingly prescriptive um, because you want to have the flexibility in that kind of potentially emergency situation to move forward. Um, well, I agree. I mean, I think this is an area that we should look at because we know the ramifications of a recall, the expense involved, and certainly we want to have a balancing of protecting the public versus preventing undue expenses to companies as well. So I'm glad to see that that is at least an area that you would be willing to uh, talk about. I might also uh, say the same thing would apply to these access of records. Uh, there really is no standard at all in this bill, but on the Senate bill, uh, it says that if FDA has a reasonable belief that an article of food prevents a threat of serious adverse health consequences or de death, uh, FDA would have access to and be able to copy all records and so forth and so forth. But under this bill, it appears that uh, the FDA would just have blanket authority to request any records at any time without any sort of standard being met. Well, here I'd like to stress that I think access to routine records is extremely important to assuring a safe food supply. It is very important that uh, when inspectors go into a facility, they can examine um, certain aspects of what have been the procedures during a, a preceding period of time and not just inspect what's happening at that moment. Had we been able to have better access to, to routine records in the case of PCA, which has been talked about already this morning, we would have been able to see that uh, there was documentation of contamination uh, several years earlier, which had not then been okay. adequately addressed. My time is about to expire, but I'd like to ask just one additional question. It relates to Jan Schakowsky's uh, comment in her opening statement about the use of antibiotics in the agriculture community and the fact that more and more people seem to be um, uh, establishing immunity to certain antibiotics. Uh, is that a concern of yours? It's a huge concern of mine in terms of the growing problem of antibiotic resistance in this country and around the world and the implications that it has for our uh, armamentarium of, of, of antibiotics to address serious and life-threatening diseases. I think it's an area that um, merits a lot of attention by the FDA working in partnership with others. It's, it's a topic I'd be happy to come back and discuss in, in more detail with you, and it, it is very uh, high priority for me in terms of overall um, goals to improve public health. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Dingell. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, welcome again, Dr. Hamburg. Congratulations. My first question, uh, it will be a yes or no answer. Uh, yes or no. Well, uh, do you, inspections are an important part of finding and addressing food safety problems. Isn't this correct? Yes. Uh, your agency does not have a good record when it comes to inspecting food facilities. Last year, you inspected 6,562 food facilities. Uh, in the United States, 152 foreign facilities in the same time. Was that enough inspections? How many should you have and what resources would you need to do the job? I think we can do better with respect to the question of exactly how many, uh, you know, I cannot tell you that now, but, um, but uh, I will I, I will submit you a letter asking these <laughs> questions in greater detail. I was detail. warned that, that you would do that. Uh, and I ask you to consent that that record, that the record remain open to include both my letter and the response of the administrator. Uh, would you support, so ordered. would you support an increased uh, frequency requirement? We clearly need to do more frequent inspections. We also need to do smarter inspections, and we need not to rely simply on inspections as our tool 
for a safer food supply. We, we agree on that. <laughs> I am keenly aware that there is a substantial cost associated with conducting foreign and domestic facility inspections. Uh, how much do you need to do this properly in well, terms of personnel and money? If you can't give it now, I'll ask the record be kept open. All right. So well, there, it's a it's a complicated answer, and there are some unknowables, but uh, we need Chairman, a I lot have, more I have to money. the record remain open so that this can be inserted at appropriate time. Mr. Chairman, the record will remain open. You don't have to keep Thank saying you. it. Thank uh, you. Uh, and it is clear that with new inspection requirements, FDA is going to need new additional resources to meet that requirement, is it not? That is absolutely true. The President has asked additional resources for food safety activities at the agency. Uh, he, he requested, I'm told, about $259 million in additional money. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Um, it was the President's intent that these additional dollars uh, amounting to $164.8 million in new budget authority and 94.4 million in new fees, registrations, reinspection, and export certification would be used for inspecting, or rather for increasing the number of food facility ins inspections conducted by your agency. Is that not correct? It would be used for that as well as other uh, components of a, of a more you. comprehensive, modernized food safety Thank you. system. Uh, it's correct that the present budget requests for food safety's activity did not include any new requirements that may come with the food safety legislation or new food safety legislation that we're considering here. Is that correct? I'm sorry, but could you repeat the question? The President's request for new monies did not include monies to address the questions that you will be compelled to face under the new legislation. Is that correct? It, it addressed some components, but not the full not all. panoply of um, requirements that are outlined in this legislation. Uh, there are many who have resisted new money for improving food inspection frequency by the agency. They've asked that the use of these dollars for such activity be prohibited. Would you agree with that or disagree? You know, I hate to do this, but this style of questioning is... Um, I'm sorry, I have limited time. I know. 12 seconds left. Could you just repeat the question? Question. Do you agree with the idea that we should prohibit the use of, of registration fees for inspection? I think we need registration fees um, to enable the agency to do uh, its inspectional activities and other components of a food safety plan. As a matter of fact, one of the few successful activities at Food and Drug at this particular time is what you do under PDUFA, which is supported by fees. Is that not correct? That is correct. And you're starving in almost every other place. Isn't that so? Correct. Uh, can, you, can you state uh, with any certainty the number of people, importers, customs, brokers, filers who import products under FDA's jurisdiction to the United States in any year? I believe the answer to that question is no. Is no, and, and this, this legislation would enable us to get a much better handle on who is out there uh, producing and distributing uh, food for and, U.S. consumption. And the reason is that they are not currently required to register with FDA. Isn't that the reason? That's a large part of the reason, yes. Uh, isn't it important to FDA to have an accurate, up-to-date accounting of who these people are? Very important. Now, these individuals are not required to comply with certain requirements to ensure the safety of these products uh, th that they import. Uh, they can handle any type of FDA-related products and are not required to have any specific training so to do. Is that not correct? Uh, that is correct. We would like to make sure that, that individuals importing food into the United States followed uh, standards and guidelines that we expect with domestic food production. Good. The domestic draft, uh, the discussion draft establishes a program to require importers, U.S. custom brokers of foods, drugs, and devices, and other filers to register with FDA and, re to, and require that good importer practices are maintained as a condition for maintaining registration. Do you agree with that requirement? We would like importers to be registered. Now, one more question 
uh, that, I, and, and that, well, I tell you what, I note my time is up. Um, Madam Administrator, I will be submitting you a letter. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your patience, and I thank my colleagues. I would note that the changes in the draft that we have before us today are those which have been largely done in consultation with FDA and in consultation with my minority colleagues. The next changes that you see will originate in about the same way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Dingell. Uh, next is the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Boyer. Uh, thank, yes. thank you. Given your, uh, your statement, you, you support the FDA's ability to trace foods more quickly during an out outbreak, so you would support a track and trace system with regard to food. Is that correct? I would. I think it is very important to our ability to respond quickly uh, to outbreaks of concern. And you are, since you, you uh, appear to be in endorsing the, the bill, this draft discussion bill in front of us, you also support then the FDA's ability to ha uh, increase uh, inspections of food processing facilities. Would that be correct? I think we'd need to do more inspections, but as I said earlier, I think we also need to recognize that it isn't simply uh, increasing the number of inspections that will get us to the food safety system that we need, but it's, it's also uh, instituting the preventive controls and really shifting uh, the way we think about uh, food safety and also, uh, you know, stronger partnerships with state and locals and foreign governments, strengthening. When, when you discover a contaminated food, you believe it's your responsibility then to prevent the distribution of that contaminated food into the marketplace. Is that not correct? Yes. So you're asking for that ability to do a recall. Would that be correct? Yes. And that uh, once that contaminated food has been discovered, do you believe that you should have the ability to order the destruction of the contaminated food? It depends on the, the specific circumstance. Sometimes with the con contaminated food, it, it might be possible to reprocess it and make it available in a safe way. But if it is contaminated and putting consumers at risk um, and, and such a, an option does not exist, then that food should not be allowed to be um, provided to consumers. Since you support a federal tracking system for food, would you also be willing to support a electronic pedigree system for an interoperable tracking system for pharmaceuticals? You know, I think that in, in both realms, it is very important to know where things is this came yes? from and where they're going. Is this um, a yes? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to... Uh, to. You're going to choose contaminated lettuce over adulterated drugs? I don't think so. No, I'm not. I'm, I, I didn't think your question was either or. I All right, my question is, if you're going to support a pedigree system for the tracking and tracing of contaminated food, don't you also believe that it's important for us to an have an electronic pedigree for the tracking and tracing of pharmaceuticals? In, in concept, I, I think, as I said, that, that traceability is, is very important to assure um, that what consumers get All right. is Let me get to this. Safe. We have 11 international mail facilities. Add three other mail facilities, uh, DHL, um, UPS, and FedEx of which 30 to 35,000 packages, pharmaceutical packages, come into those mail facilities every day. So do the math. When you do your inspections, about 80% of them are either, either adulterated or they're, they're counterfeit, knockoffs, yet FDA claims they don't have the, the ability to destroy. So you're, you're, you're sitting here before this committee today saying that you now believe that you should have increased ability to inspect and, and to go after this contaminated food, I want to make sure that you also believe that you should have the ability to destroy these counterfeit, knocked off drugs, because if you just do the math, that's, that's got to be in excess of 350,000 counterfeit, adulterated, knock off drug packages per day. That's millions of packages per year that are harming people. So let me go right, right to you. Do you believe that FDA should have the authority, equal authority, to destroy these, these counterfeit, adulterated drugs? 
As I indicated earlier, this is the, my seventh day on the job, and I haven't been briefed in full on all these issues. The problem of counterfeit drugs is a huge concern, and I am eager to work with you since you clear, all right, clearly all right. care very much about it. You know it. what's happening right now? They're sitting right next. Here's Customs, and right over here is FDA. There's not even a wall. Yet Customs has the ability to destroy, but you claim you don't have the ability to destroy. Please don't come before this committee and tell our country that you think we ought to be able to, to protect you with regard to food, but with regard to drugs, I can't believe as a doctor you and, wouldn't and say. I'm not, I'm not telling you that, sir. What I am well, telling be you clear. is that these are issues that are, are at the heart of the FDA mission, and as a physician, extremely important to me. There are issues that I am determined to work on, determined to work with members of Congress to find appropriate solutions. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm not comfortable at this time discussing the specifics of, of that program, right, which I haven't I, been fully I will be willing on. to work with you because I can't believe that this would be an issue that you would equivocate on. I will yield back. Gentlewoman from Colorado, Mr. Gap. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Dr. Hamburg, I want to uh, add my welcome to the, that of my colleagues to your appointment. I know you're going to be working with this committee on a lot of different issues. I want to talk to you about the um, traceback system because we have worked very closely over the years and most particularly um, on this latest iteration of the legislation on setting forth mandatory characteristics that would be contained in the tracing system that the FDA sets up through the regulatory process. For example, the bill requires that the origin and previous distribution history of food must be maintained, and that history must be linked with the subsequent distribution history of the food. And it also requires, to me, this is a really key component, that the system be interoperable. So for different types of food, they can figure it out. Um, some people question whether it will be ever be feasible to implement this type of system? And I'm wondering if you can give your opinion on the feasibility of this type of a traceback provision. Well, as you, as you indicated, it is very, very important and key to our success in being able to respond swiftly to outbreaks and, and make the appropriate interventions to protect the American public. Interoperability is absolutely key because it involves um, a whole range of different players along the, the full life cycle of the product, um, and that's one of the great challenges. I think as we move forward in, in developing and implementing a traceability um, program, we need to work very carefully uh, with industry and, and with the, the different components of the, the food production uh, system. We need to do it in the context of, of public meetings and, and open exchange, um, but that should be our goal, absolutely. And, and um, in, in the draft legislation, that's exactly what we do, is we give the FDA the authority to work with industry and consumer groups to develop uh, both the specific types of traceability technology and also the interoperability, correct? Yes. In, in other words, we're not, um, we're not saying D different sectors of the um, different sectors of the food industry have different types of trace traceability requirements. And we're not saying that that we have a one size fits all. Correct. Correct. Um, do you think that there's an economic case to be made to the industry for better traceability? I think absolutely, because with the opportunity to really do adequate traceback, we can really target what are the components of a food or the specific food products um, that are causing the problem and, and remove those or, or put in place the interventions to decrease the risk uh, to that particular uh, component of the, the food life cycle, um, in that way we can both save lives and reduce illness, but I think also reduce the costs to companies who, as we've heard about this morning, you know, have occasionally been inappropriately um, 
targeted uh, when the trace back was inadequate and, and we didn't um, identify the, the correct uh, product, and also when there's a whole industry but it's only one um, processor or manufacturer that's the problem, then we can protect the rest of the industry by really honing in on the particular product at risk. And, and once we develop the system, it should also make, make identification and removal of the specific contaminated food much more speedy than it has Absolutely. been, which again benefits consumer health and it benefits the um, economic interests of that sector. Um, just one last question. Um, the draft legislation that we've prepared exempts farms that sell directly to consumers or to restaurants from the traceability requirements, the, the uh, farmers markets and so on. Do you think that that's an appropriate carve out for them? I think that we have to recognize the burdens on, on smaller businesses, um, but we also, from a public health point of view, have to assure that when there is a problem, we can get access to the information that's needed to identify the, the source of a contaminated food. Um, so we need to work very closely with... Yeah. You know, one, one thing is um, that these farmers markets, for example, they're not broadly distributing their food. It's just local. So if someone did get sick, the state health department could easily trace it. It certainly right makes back. it easier to do the outbreak investigation. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gentleman from Illinois is ready. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, can I ask you a question, a process question first? Uh, you're sure. Uh, is there a possibility that the subcommittee may consider this legislation next week? Yes. And if so, I would ask then if members who uh, could submit questions for the record by the close of business tomorrow, could we have witnesses respond to those questions by the close of business Monday? Sounds like a good idea to me, since we're likely to mark up next week. You have no problem with that. I think that's a very appropriate approach. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we, we do know Without objection, uh, that's what we'll do. We know that's challenging, but of course this is a, a draft, and as I said in the opening statement, so we, we appreciate that. Um, and again, we do appreciate your testimony, and welcome on board, and um, uh, we're all working for, uh, I'm really on the same team, trying to get uh, responsible legislation that protects human health while ensuring that fees go to where fees need to go. Um, so uh, I, I just have two. One, um, and this is a, goes back to, in history, um, and two, de well, two decades ago when Congress was deliberating how to improve the state clinical laboratory testing, and I've been in the lab tech issue uh, uh, a lot. This committee, under the leadership of now Chairman Meredith, Mr. Dingo, Mr. Waxman, and my own, like, uh, 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 former um, um, colleague Mr. Madigan issued a conference report stating that proficiency testing is considered one of the best measures of laboratory performance and arguably the most important measure since it reviews actual test results rather than merely gauging the potential for good results. As we examine the discussion draft and its call for accreditation standards for laboratories to perform analytical testing on food, in your opinion, should proficiency testing be explicitly included here too? I think that we would only want to work with accredited labs and the accreditation process um, addresses those, those kinds of, of concerns. The accuracy of the testing is, is, is key to making the right decisions and, um, you know, I think that as we move forward, um, laboratory testing uh, needs to be a, a strong component of, of what we do. And so efforts to ensure the accuracy of testing results is absolutely key to protect um, businesses and to provide uh, the public health system with the information it needs to take action on. And I would agree with that. I think that uh, as close as to a, a yes as I'll get, and that's fine, but I think that's a critical component and if we're going to do this, that the proficiency test be a process by which we, you know, test the tester so we have some uh, certainty. Let, let me go back, and I know we've talked about this uh, 75 uh, million in, in, uh, in the President's budget and the 375 million in revenue, and I mentioned this in my opening statement before some of the discussion, and I, I understand that, uh, you know, this legislation offers more 
authority, and so that's why there may be a differing number than what the President proposed. But I, I think a lot of us are going to be challenged by the fact, um, and, and what would be helpful before we move to markup is, you know, show us the money. Show us, sh show us where we came up with this amount. Uh, we've are, as I said also, there's already been a lot, millions of dollars put into food safety over the past six months. Um, a lot of us are trying to understand where 375 million came out. We understand that there was a thousand per facility, and you add up the facilities, you get 375 million. But that doesn't answer the question as to where is that money? Is that money going to go to an inspection regime? And what does it cost to do an inspection regime? Especially on this, I've been a, a really a strong spokesperson for a risk-based system. Now. The risk-based system promoted in this draft legislation is nowhere near what I believe a risk-based system should be. Um, uh, I think you should go after risky individuals and, and, and facilities that, in essence, offer no risk. You ought to incentivize them, and I've, this has been statements that I've made for a long time. So I think even this risk-based approach that we're saying can be modified somewhat. Um, so. Is there a way to give us a, get us a better handle, uh, or do you have better numbers that that support this discussion draft that 375 million dollars actually means uh, 374 million more dollars worth the ability to inspect? Well, regrettably, I don't believe that the 375 million will cover the costs of in inspecting on the schedule. Um, outlined in the bill, we actually would need considerably more resources to do that. Uh, we know, um, you know, based on, on estimates vary, but that, that domestic inspections cost um, a little over $9,000. Uh, International inspections are probably threefold higher, um, and the, the number of, of facilities requiring inspection are, are very, very large, numbering in the hundreds of thousands. Well, the I, numbers I, add up quickly. And my time's expired, and I apologize. Um, I, I would just say that uh, there, there's going to be skeptics that say, okay, we've got $375 million on a fee schedule, and it's not going to go for inspection. It's we'll going to go, go to inspection. other aspects of the FDA. and and it would help provide us some clarity. And, and Mr. Chairman, if I can just end on this, because uh, the Chairman Emeritus mentioned this once again, that, there, that there's been negotiation with his Republican colleagues. I, I would call them information positions of, of the answer of no, uh, not uh, really negotiations on addresses of the bill. And I would encourage, maybe this is going to be a member-member discussion. But if, if we really want to claim that this, we want a bipartisan bill, we ought to have some just not dictates, this is what we're going to do, but this is where we need to work together. And I, and I yield back my time. Thank you. Let, let me just reiterate again what, we, uh, what Mr. Shimka suggested in terms of the questions. We're, we're going to ask the witnesses, including you in the next panel, and I'll rem remind the next panel that um, they submit their questions, that members submit questions by the end of, of tomorrow night, which would be Thursday night, and that we have responses by the end of business day on Monday, okay? I'll, I'll mention that again. I, I mean, I don't know if it may be difficult to meet that schedule, but... Yeah, and I, would the chairman yield? And we understand that's a lot to ask, uh, but right. uh, for us to move, I think it's... Yeah, that's fine, and we'll... we'll you know, no, we're we'll happy to, to comply with that. We appreciate okay. that you're taking this so seriously and wanting to move it forward swiftly. All right, thank you. Uh, gentlewoman from California, Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've... Uh, uh, sat here for a few hours listening to this hearing, and I, I think uh, the content is very important. And I do think this committee has uh, developed a, an, an enormous record on this subject. This is not new information uh, for, for members of this committee. And I do think we will be able to move legislation uh, next week, and I hope it will be bipartisan. And I agree with Mr. Shimkus that there should be opportunity for the other side uh, to participate. Um, uh, I, I wanted to uh, acknowledge a comment that Mr. Boyer made before uh, he left uh, the hearing room. He was 
uh, in some fashion implying that uh, Dr. Hamburg is not focused on, on uh, drug safety. Uh, my response to that is, of course she is. She's been here for 10 minutes, and the first topic up is food safety. So uh, let's give her and this committee time uh, to focus on that subject in the near I future and, and not be accusing each other of, uh, uh, in some way of, of perhaps um, inadequate uh, attention. On the subject of food safety, which is what we're talking about, there is a section in the legislation about testing by accredited labs. Last year, I recall uh, a huge uh, worry about whether the, the prior administration was going to cut back on the number of accredited labs and the impact that would have on major ports of entry, like the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, my district happens to be there, uh, that are, are the place where enormous amounts of import, imported food uh, enter the country. Uh, so I just want to give you a chance, Dr. Hamburg, not in terms of a yes and no answer <laughs> session, right. but could you uh, assure us that, that uh, lab capacity is a priority of yours and assure us that there will be adequate lab capacity uh, for the anticipated uh, importation of food and, and for the standards in this legislation uh, to work? Absolutely. Laboratory testing is an, is an essential component of a strong science-based food safety system, and we do not have any plans to uh, restrict our, our laboratory capacity, and I think, you know, as we move forward, we will want to make sure that we are applying the best possible science, including laboratory science, to our, our testing and screening. Uh, activities. I hope that there will be advances in laboratory science and technology that will enable us uh, to to do our inspections in a in a more efficient and cost effective way. Uh, but it's a it's a pillar of what we do, and we will continue to support it. And we may, as resources become available and and needs uh, suggest, actually expand our capacity. Well, I appreciate that, and I'm not suggesting that, that our current lab structure be frozen in time. Obviously, if there are improvements either in location or in function, we ought to embrace that. Uh, but another one of the concerns that has been expressed is the ability to get the results from the lab uh, to the FDA in a timely mm -hmm. manner. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think the current system is adequate in that respect, and, and are you thinking about improvements to that. Well, we're, we're eager to implement um, a system for reportable foods that will include uh, laboratories reporting positive tests to FDA, and I think that will be uh, a very important additional element to our activities. Good. Well, I appreciate that, too. Obviously, in light of some of the recent outbreaks and their devastating impact on, on um, human life and health, yeah. uh, it's important to get that information um, uh, out and accurate as soon yeah. as possible. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't have uh, further questions of the witness. I'm just thrilled that she's here. I yield back. Thank you. Gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think your uh, time is almost up. <laughs> Thank you for your patience with all of the questions and listening to all of our opening statements. In, in your testimony, you reference section 106 that provides the uh, more explicit authority for FDA to access food records during inspections. Do you think that that's enough or should we go further in the legislation to mandate that those records be forwarded to um, FDA? You know, I, th I think what's outlined in the legislation is certainly a very good starting point. Um, we don't want to be inundated with information. We don't want to put too much of a burden on, um, on industry. But we do need that access uh, to records. We need companies to, to keep uh, appropriate records, and we need to be able to have it to be able to inform our, our routine inspectional activities, to be able to work with the companies to make sure that they have adequate preventive controls in place, and we need it certainly in the event of, of a serious outbreak of public health concern to enable us to, to swiftly get the information we need for action. So you think that 
requiring them to have their plans and to have their plans audited uh, in conjunction with your authority to, to have access to the records should be sufficient? You know, I think we would want this to be a dynamic process as we learn more, putting in place um, the, the programs and policies and then learning from experience. But I think that the, the bill lays out a, a very sensible um, and doable approach. Okay. And um, you also talk about the huge task of hiring and training inspectors. And if I understand correctly, you're asking for some more flexibility in, in the legislation uh, to be able to do that. Uh, are you asking for general flexibility or would a transitional timetable with time certain in the legislation work just as well? Well, I think we, we just have to recognize that, that this would be an enormous scale up of activity and that we need um, the, the time frame to enable us to do it right, to recruit the people and train the people to work with industry, um, to develop the systems that, that, that work. Um, so we'd like flexibility in that way, and we would like more general flexibility so that we can can learn as as we go in terms of of the inspection schedule and um, some of the the requirements uh, in that regard. Okay, I, my last question is is kind of a general one. Uh, I don't think it was asked before, but even as late as yesterday, uh, someone asked the secretary the question about one single entity. Um, to secure food, food safety uh, with the authority over the food safety um, uh, program for the country. Um, I'm sure, I don't think the secretary supported it. I, I'm sure you don't support it, but um, what can you say about, uh, if you've had a chance to look at how FDA and USDA work together or uh, don't work as well together as they should, what can you, you say about addressing the concerns that gave rise to mm -hmm. um, the legislation that would put it in a single entity? Well, a, a, a couple of responses to your important question. One is that, that clearly as the new FDA commissioner, I have a first and urgent priority to strengthen food safety within the FDA. And I think that there, there are many things that we can do to strengthen our program, to improve accountability, uh, to raise uh, the issue as, as a high priority. Uh, part of strengthening food safety within FDA is strengthening coordination with critical partners as well, and that certainly means with USDA, and I look forward to a productive working relationship with them. It also means strengthening um, the working partnerships with state and local public health organizations, and it very importantly also involves working with other um, international agencies and, and, and government, foreign governments uh, because I think we're going to see the percentage of food coming in from overseas increasing in the years to come and, and the globalization has a profound impact on the work of the FDA. And I also do think that the authorities um, and tools that this new draft legislation could potentially provide to the FDA will be extremely important in, in moving um, the federal government and the FDA in the direction that we need to for a robust and modernized uh, food safety system. Thank you for your answers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My Thank you. Gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much, Dr. Hanberg, for your service and uh, for all that uh, I'm confident you're going to do to improve food safety in this country. Um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, Ohio has been hit hard by issues uh, arising from food safety. In the past year, there have been 105 cases of salmonella uh, reported in Ohio and sadly three deaths uh, resulting from the most recent peanut-based strain. Nellie Napier was a constituent of mine who unfortunately died um, uh, from salmonella poisoning that she contracted in a nursing facility. And just in April of this year, uh, in Cuyahoga County, there were three incidences of illness from E. coli and another death, um, this time a seven-year-old girl. So this is an urgent issue uh, for the people that I'm so honored to represent. 
I mentioned that I introduced the Protect Consumers Act, which was uh, a bill that would give the FDA mandatory recall authority, and I'm happy to see that it is a part of this comprehensive bill. Um, and I'd just like to get a little bit more of your opinion about the need for uh, recall authority. And this bill, of course, uh, seeks to remedy the situation of the FDA not having the mandatory recall authority by laying out two different types of recall authorities. First, if the FDA believes that a certain food may cause um, adverse health consequences or death, the FDA can recall, uh, require a recall. But in the, uh, that scenario, FDA must first give the company an opportunity to voluntarily recall its own products. And if that doesn't work, then the FDA can order a mandatory recall. And then, of course, the second type of recall is an emergency recall if the FDA finds that a certain food presents a threat of serious adverse health consequences or death. You may do that immediately. Can you just tell me about whether you think that the need and the approach, the two-tiered approach, um, is, is addressed uh, uh, in, a, in a good way in this bill and why it makes sense? Well, I think the history is that voluntary recall is often effective in, in getting those potentially harmful products uh, off the shelves and um, protecting consumers, but that you do need that emergency mandatory recall uh, function as a, as a backup. There certainly have been cases where the mandatory recall of a, of a dangerous product has been delayed because of a reluctance on the part of, of the company uh, to, to pull that product and, and there's, has, there's been a back and forth and lawyers involved and delays of, of, of weeks um, putting consumers at risk. So I think that the, to have the, the mandatory recall as an emergency measure is, is very, very important. And sadly, in a world where we, we might also need to address intentional contamination of food, that emergency mandatory recall becomes, becomes a very, very important tool. It, it, you know, I think the, the reality is that it, it, having that as an enforcement tool probably makes it easier to also work with companies on the voluntary recall. So I think it's, it's a continuum that we need. We need both. Will the gentleman gen yield just on the same point? Just a follow-up on this. I have very little time, but I'll yield. Yeah, ju to her. just to follow up, I, I, one of the issues would be may cause. That's kind of a low standard. I think there's going to be concern about the may cause language in here, and how do you define that? Um, yes. Well, we we discussed that earlier, and I think perhaps there's some wordsmithing that could be be done on that point. Thank you. Thank you. I thank my colleague. Sure. And, and if I could just follow up um, on the, the, the suggestion that has been made, and some have argued that because mandatory recall is such a strong tool that only the commissioner should be able to exercise the authority to order a recall with no further delegation. And I just wanted to know about your thoughts on the approach of having only the commissioner order a recall and how that would work for the FDA. Um, and, and frankly, while I'm at it, um, would such an approach work with regard to suspensions and subpoenas? And what are your thoughts about those subjects? Well, these are important and powerful authorities that shouldn't be used lightly. However, I think that um, experience shows that senior level officials can be entrusted with these authorities along with the, the commissioner, but it's certainly something that, that we would want to, to work with, with Congress on uh, in order to, to put in place the system that people have the most confidence in. I thank you, and I, um, I'm certain that uh, we share concerns about expediency and making sure things happen in a quick time, and I think Absolutely. that uh, your answer on the way that the recall authority would work, you having the mandatory, mandatory um, authority would give you an opportunity to, uh, to encourage even more strongly, or they would be necessarily encouraged, uh, the companies to comply on their own as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, Dr. Amberg, appreciate your patience today. And, and uh, but if you think this is tough, you have FDA to work on, <laughs> which is, uh, and I laugh because in uh, 
07. We spent a great deal of our time both in the subcommittee and the full committee in reforming FDA. And then last year with all the food safety issues that came up, it seemed like we're, we're back at it again and, and uh, I'm glad you're there. Um, in my opening statement, I mentioned my concerns about the location and number of FDA labs, and I know my colleague from Southern California, um, Congressman Harmon, mentioned the same thing. Um, Texas does have the longest running border with Mexico and the Port of Houston, um, similar to, uh, is right behind Port of LA Long Beach, um, and imported um, tons of food. Yet we don't have an FDA lab, and I've had the honor to meet my FDA inspectors on the docks at the Port of Houston, but they are detailed out of Laredo, Texas, and uh, I guess because it's such a large state, in the the need for a lab somewhere, uh, I'm glad the bill does include the ability to contract with labs because that's uh, we want the inspections done as quick as possible. Uh, does the FDA intend to evaluate the current locations of the 13 labs and whether these locations are meeting the inspection demands, but also in the President's budget um, talks about three high volume FDA labs and how would the FDA decide where the, to place these labs and what considerations be placing in place like Texas or even Southern California. I didn't know Southern California didn't have a lab with LA Long Beach. Mm -hmm. And that's my only question. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated that the laboratory issue comes up so much here because it's, it's such a key issue. And in my past experience as a public health official, it's, it's often the laboratory that's the underappreciated uh, component of public health needs. So this, this, is, this is very encouraging to me. At the present time, we don't have any plans um, to expand that basic, you know, network of, of laboratories um, that, that you mentioned. Although, as I said to Congresswoman Harmon, you know, with additional resources and, and expanding need, that might be a possibility. We will be creating um, some additional high throughput laboratories. Um, and in all honesty, I'm not, I'm not certain um, about the process by which uh, those laboratories are, are being um, developed and, and cited. It's something I need to go back as, as a, a very new FDA commissioner and, and learn uh, more about. Um, but the laboratory issue is, is, is one that is essential, as we've discussed. I guess the reason it comes up so often is that over the last three years, actually, our, our committee spent so much time on, you know, pharmaceutical safety, food safety, and the concern is, is that uh, we're importing so much of our food. Um, like I said, Laredo, Texas is probably the biggest land-based port in the world, and so much food comes from Mexico. Uh, we need the, the inspections as timely as possible to move the produce uh, or whatever the products, the foodstuffs particularly. But we also need to make sure that it's, uh, and the problem is it's not paid for. Uh, but with this fee that's going to be assessed, hopefully that will generate the, the resources both for the personnel and, and also for the facilities. And I guess um, if you're having to contract with private labs, that may be great, but there are times that a public lab would, uh, would be faster and ultimately cheaper to the, to the folks who pay the bills. And uh, so that's why I just asked the FDA to look at that, that if I'm glad we're going to contract because uh, we want the commerce to flow, but, uh, but if there is a need to have a lab that would be more economical, and, and just as fast as contracting with the private labs, um, then I would hope this funding source, because I guess over the last three years, our hearings have said FDA's, the staff, we don't have the staff, we don't have the resources, where well, we're going to try to give you the resources in this bill, and hopefully the higher the staff and they have the facilities. And, and let me also just assure you that, that y your constituents are not being compromised in terms of, of uh, the laboratory uh, testing that, that's needed to protect their food supply because samples can be, be shipped yeah. to labs. It doesn't, it, 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 in the modern era, it can be done in a timely and, and, and yeah. safe way. So, so the, the coverage in terms of laboratory testing is still available, but I hear and understand your concern about um, the, the, the gap in terms of a, an on-site uh, facility in, in, in your region. Well, and I think the fear that some of us have is that we don't want to play favorites. Uh, these ports compete for cargo, 
and we don't want it to be based on that there's not an FDA lab or it's slower to get this uh, through one port as compared to the other port. And I know I've run out of time, but appreciate what your the responsibility you're taking on, and hopefully we'll be will provide you with the tools that you need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Green. Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner, for being here. Uh, as Chair of Oversight and Investigations and one of the authors of the Food Safety Enhancement Act, uh, we've seen, I've had about nine hearings in the last two years just on food safety and certainly is a major problem. One of the problems I found every time we had a hearing uh, there was always a lack of information that the FDA did not have from either the manufacturer of the food or the pr producer of that food, and uh, it was always difficult to get information. In the Safety Enhancement Act authorizes the FDA to issue subpoenas for records and other things relevant to any hearing, investigation, or proceeding, or relative to any other matter within the FDA's jurisdiction, including matters under the Public Health Services Act and the Federal Anti-Tampering Act. Uh, do you believe subpoena power would be beneficial to the FDA? It's very important for us to get access in a timely way to the information that we need. And uh, I think that, that that authority will enable us to, to act more swiftly and effectively, yes. Well, we hope you would because I, I, I think we're still waiting for information from the 2007 salmonella outbreak in peanut butter and from the Georgia plant, Blakely, Georgia. I don't think we got all that information yet. Uh, some in the food industry, though, appear to be concerned that the FDA will abuse its subpoena power. Their concern center around the subpoena provision that authorizes the FDA to issue subpoenas in matters under FDA's jurisdiction that are not part of a particular hearing or investigation of a specific violation of the Act. There seems to be a fear that FDA will go on fishing expeditions, constantly stand, sending out burdensome, unnecessary requests for documents. How would you address these concerns? Well, I, I think that we have enough work to do without going on fishing expeditions. Uh, we would be seeking information that would be of, of vital importance uh, to addressing the, the tasks at hand. It would, it would be of, of great value um, to have the ability to access critical information to inform the inspection process. Uh, as well as to inform outbreak investigations. And I think that if we are going to be able to, to really move forward to ensure the safety of the food supply, this is, is one of a number of, in, of tools that will enable us to really do what needs to be done. Well, it's re refreshing to hear because I've been pushing subpoena power for the FDA for 10 years. and. I'd uh, get a witness to agree with me from the FDA, but by the time I got back to my office, the FDA would call me and say, that's not the official position of the FDA. We're against the penis. So it's refreshing to hear that, and, and I'm sure you won't use it for a fishing expedition. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, Chairman Waxman and I wrote to you about uh, to review this phenol A, BPA. Uh, while a previous FDA commissioner found no problem with it, FDA's own science review board says there was room for concern. And we wrote to you, and, and, and you've wrote back indicating that uh, you've agreed to review the safety of BPA. So let me just say thank you on, on that point. Uh, I think it's important that we look at all the documents and all the evidence and all the studies, uh, not just two studies when there's over 100 other studies that raise concern on bisphenol, bisphenol A. Uh, also on uh, food safety on, on the lab situation, uh, it's been my concern. The last uh, FDA commissioner thought food safety was to close six or seven of the 13 field labs, which I thought was the wrong idea. Uh, so we've always fought uh, a reorganization or closing in these labs, and we actually had to put in legislation to make sure these field people, critical work for the FDA and for the safety of American people, stay on their jobs. And you recently wrote back to me, uh, myself and, and Chairman Waxman indicating that there are no current or future plans to close or consolidate any of these 13 field laboratories. And you also went on and said that uh, you're actually hoping you'll be able to hire at least 70, 70 new analysis for the 13 labs to replace staff losses over the last few fiscal years. So thank you for that. And it, without objection, I'd like to place the record from the commissioner in, in, in the uh, record, this With, letter in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Let me ask you one more question, if I may. Risk-based inspection schedule. One of the important new requirements in the new food safety bill will be to put into place is 
pass is, is a risk based inspection schedule for food facilities. Under current law, even risky facilities can go years between FDA inspections, but our legislation has strict requirements to make sure FDA inspect inspectors actually get into the riskiest facilities as frequently as possible. The riskiest facilities must be inspected at least every 6 to 18 months. No food and production or storage facility will go more than four years between inspections. Under current law, there is, there is not any requirement regarding how frequently these ins facilities must be inspected, is there? Certainly. There is not, and, and I think that uh, your desire to, to see a risk-based strategy be put in place is, is absolutely key so that we can target resources on the highest risk. D does this bill give you the flexibility you need to modify the inspection goals based on available resources and the best available evidence on risk? Well, as I said in my testimony, I, I am concerned about uh, the re requirements for inspection outstripping available resources, and that's been a, a chronic problem for the FDA in terms of being able to fulfill its important uh, mission. I think that it's the inspectional um, strategy outlined in the draft legislation is, a, is a, a wonderful aspirational goal. I would love to be able to sit here and say that FDA could take it on and, and, and fully achieve it, but there is a reality of, of limited resources, both dollar and human, and I think that's where we need some flexibility to, to really look at, at the numbers and really also uh, begin to move swiftly in, in, in the direction outlined in this bill, but also try to, to learn as we go so that we can, can find ways to do our inspections uh, in a more efficient, targeted way and really focus on the, the highest risk and, and really try to leverage other resources to achieve the goals as well through partnership with, with state and locals, partnership with, with foreign governments, and potentially uh, with, with um, third parties that are certified and overseen by the FDA uh, to help us, uh, particularly with respect to the burgeoning number of, of foreign sites for inspection. Well, the 400,000 um, possible sorry, facilities. Sorry, Mr. Supak, but we're like I just want to mention about the registration fee for 400,000 right. 400, possible ones. No more questions, though. We're, we're done with questions. Go ahead. <laughs> you had a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say, hopefully sure. the registration fee that we'd be putting in place with up to 400,000 facilities would provide enough resources to do the inspection and other work that the FDA sorely needs to, to the resources and the personnel to do it. And we understand that, and hopefully that will be part of the bill. And Mr. thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for your help on this bill. Thank you. Mr. Deal. I yield briefly to Mr. Chimkus for a follow-up. And I thank my ranking member, and I'm glad my colleagues here, because I'm going to follow up on this wordsmithing that we talked about on the May cause. That's why we still have the same problem on the subpoena power issue, because in the subsection 3 it says any other matter relative to the commissioner's jurisdiction under this act. There's not, I, would, I would like there to be a May cause. I, don't, I have a problem with the May cause in the other part of the bill or the draft. We should at least have a May cause for a, a offering a subpoena to someone. And so I would hope that that would be something else we'd look at. So I think there is some issues. We want subpoena power, but we want it, be, it be for a reason. We just don't want it to be at the, at the whim of, uh, with all due respect, <laughs> Dr. Hamburg. And I'll yield back would, to the ranking member. Um, let me ask you a question with regard to another area, and that is the registration and fees collected from commercial importers. And there's been a change in this draft from previous uh, drafts that we have seen. Specifically, uh, why should drug and device manufacturers who currently already pay an annual establishment fee be required to pay a duplicative fee? And what entities are really encompassed within this uh, commercial importation fee schedule? Well, the, the importer fee refers to uh, fees on the, the individuals or the, the companies that are serving as the, the, the link between um, foods that are, are 
grown, processed, um, manufactured overseas and being brought into the United States to be distributed to consumers here. And, and so they, they're not uh, necessarily representing a given manufacturer, um, but, but it's a very important function because it's, it's that bridge between um, what is happening on the international scene and, and what is coming into this country for use. Specifically with regard to the drug and device manufacturers who currently already register and already pay a fee, uh, would you envision that they're going to have to pay an additional registration fee uh, in addition to what FDA already collects from them? And if so, why? Um, in terms of, of the importer function, I don't. I, I, I need to go back and, and look at this issue with respect to devices because I don't. I don't know how that system is set up. Whether it's the the manufacturer that is serving in that role or not. So I I, I, I will would go you back take, and would you take a look at that? About that. I, I think that's one that we really seriously need to look at. I don't think we ought to be duplicating uh, what you're already doing because you have jurisdiction there. I think that would be unfair. Um, let me ask you also quickly, with regard to. Um, the tracing uh, of food, uh, the, the tracing system that is put in, in place for you to issue regulations, um, it appears that that would include the restaurants to be, uh, be able to have traceability. And I'm told that about seven out of every ten eating establishments are not part of chain operation. They're just independent, uh, separate food operations. Um, I'm just curious as to whether or not you think that uh, this would have a serious impact on these small business owners, and do you think we ought to do a cost-benefit analysis before we impose that kind of cost on these individuals? Well, I think clearly we we want to work with with restaurant owners and small businesses in order to make sure that the systems are not too cumbersome. But it's very important that they keep records. Because if, if there is a tainted food that is, is in their facility, uh, the implications for the health of their business as well as for the health of their consumers is, is, is very significant indeed. And I think that they would, they would want to be able to assist in sharing their information about where the foods came from so that the, the trace back can occur and we can identify the source of an outbreak and control it. So I think they're a very important link in, in the, the food supply chain and um, you know, protecting health really depends on them keeping records. Let me ask you, what has FDA done to implement the current, what I think is called the one up, one back um, traceability? requirements? What, what has been done to implement that? Well, the, the one up, one back has been in place, as I understand it, for, for a while now. But it, 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 it has proven not to be um, adequate to really capture the, the, the full um, life cycle of a, of a product. And that, that we really need, as I mentioned earlier, the, the full supply chain to be uh, documented and integrated, interoperability, not just fragments, you know, is really key to successful and swift investigation of outbreaks and the ability uh, to, to control a problem and, and prevent future um, exposures to a contaminated food product. Thank you. Uh, just the way we're proceeding, Mr. Markey is, is going to go now, and he's our last. Okay. Uh, questioner for you, Dr. Hamburg. We have one vote, but we'll be right back after that, So, and then we'll start with the second panel. So, Mr. Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Hamburg. Thank you. Um, you. You may know that I have a bill <clears throat> that calls for BPA to be banned from being used in food and beverage containers uh, because of the risks that have been identified. Uh, we've also recently learned that the food and chemical industries have launched a public relations campaign uh, opposing any efforts to deal with this uh, issue. Is the FDA concerned about uh, BPA 
and what does the FDA plan to do about those concerns? Well, we, we are concerned. Certainly, I'm aware of, you know, some of the, the studies that have, have raised issues in, in animal um, populations and, and some of the information about um, BPA um, uh, in many components of the, the food supply. We are starting to see activities at the, the local and the state level in terms of, of action with respect to BPA, and I, I would hope that, that FDA could really be providing leadership on some of these issues of, of assessing um, and analyzing risk. Uh, we are taking another look at the BPA issue. The, chief, the acting chief scientist at the FDA has been asked to take the lead on this because, of course, this is a decision where we have to bring the best available uh, scientific data to bear. We need to look at, at all of the studies and examine them, but it's an issue of, of great uh, consequence for Americans as a, as a mother as well as, as a physician. It's an issue that I, I think we need to look at seriously, and I look forward to being able to come back with some report from this serious um, look that's being taken, and we expect that uh, it's going to be a task for him over the summer to lead this this review. And um, uh, by the end of the summer, we beginning of fall, we hope to be able to to put forward um, a, a fresh look at at the BPA issue. Do you have any advice for parents who? are concerned about their children ingesting this chemical? Well, I think, of course, parents that are concerned um, can find alternatives that don't have BPA. Um, and for the most part, I think that, that those alternatives are, 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 are pretty clearly labeled and, and pretty available. And I think anyone with concerns, you know, should, should do so. Okay. Thank you for your work on this. If you could keep us posted on the progress you're making on Absolutely. the evaluation of it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and, and thank you very much, Dr. Hamburg. As, as uh, we've said, you know, we do intend to move forward on this bill next week, and we appreciate your input and whatever else uh, comments you may give us by next Monday. Uh, my intention is to, we have one vote, we'll come back, and then we'll hear from our second panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership on this important issue. Subcommittee will reconvene, and I see our second panel is already seated. Let me introduce each of you. Um, on my left is Mr. Michael Ambrosio, who is the from the food marketing or representing the Food Marketing Institute, and he is the vice president for Quality Assurance Division at Wakefern Food Corporation. Next, we have Ms. Pamela G. Bailey, who is president and chief executive officer of the Grocery Manufacturers Association. And then we have Ms. Caroline Smith-DeWall, who is the Safe Food Coalition Food Safety Director of the Center for Science and the Public Interest. Dr. Tim F. Jones, who is a state epidemiolog epidemiologist from the Tennessee Department of Health. And last is Mr. Thomas E. Stenzel, who is President and CEO of United Fresh Produce uh, Association. Welcome. Uh, you know, it's five minutes, and uh, obviously your statements become part of the record if you, if you want, don't want to, uh, if you want to include material more than the five minutes. And we all heard before, I, I know some of you were wondering if you can meet the deadline, but since we do intend to go to markup next week, we, I agreed with what Mr. Um, who brought it up? Mr. Shimkus said about We'll give you any additional written questions by the end of business tomorrow, and we'd like them back by Monday at the end of business. So we'll start with uh, Mike, Dim Mike Ambrosio. Thank you for being here again. Thank you. Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Deal, and members of the Health Subcommittee, I am honored to appear before you today on behalf of the Food Marketing Institute to present our views and suggestions on the Food Safety Enhancement Act discussion draft. 
FMI and its member companies share the common goal of enacting legislation this year that will genuinely improve the safety of the food supply. Steps that actually prevent the presence of adulterants in the food supply are, only, are the only true way to improve the safety of our food. I am Mike Ambrosio, Vice President of Quality Assurance for Wake Fern, Wake Fern Food Corporation. I have been in charge of food safety programs at Wake Fern for 30 years. Founded in 1946, Wake Fern has grown from a small struggling cooperative into the nation's largest retailer-owned non-farm cooperative in the United States. We are headquartered in Keysby, New Jersey. Wakefern, along with its ShopRite stores, employs over 40, 47,000 individuals in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Maryland. Today, I am also representing FMI, a national trade association that has 1,500 member companies made up of food retailers and wholesalers in the United States and around the world. FNI, FMI members operate approximately 26,000 retail food stores with combined annual sales of roughly $400 billion, representing three quarters of all retail food store sales in the United States. FMI's retail membership is composed of national and regional chains, as well as independent grocery stores. This morning I will present several of FMI's recommendations for revising the bill, but I ask that my entire statement be included in the record. In April in 2008, I testified before this subcommittee on legislation that would have modernized the over and overhauled the food safety systems at the Food and Drug Administration. Since that time, high-profile food safety outbreaks and recalls involving tomatoes, jalapenos, peanuts, and pistachios have not only made headlines, but regrettably have caused illness and in some cases even death. Many of the themes and ideas that I share today will be similar to those that I shared in 2008, but there are differences that reflect lessons learned and new weaknesses in the existing food safety system identified from these latest recalls. As the purchasing agent for the consumer and the final link in the supply chain, our industry understands that it is vital to ensure that the FDA have the necessary authority, credibility, and resources to meet the challenges of today's global marketplace. Consumer confidence remains an essential factor in this debate. Food safety issues can be extremely complex and consumers vary greatly in their knowledge of the science and other issues affecting the safety of our food supply. However, as food safety issues draw national headlines, consumer awareness as well has a well concern about the safety of commercially prepared food and products purchased at the supermarket heightens. Mr. Chairman, I applaud you, Mr. Dingle, Chairman Waxman, and all members of the committee for your efforts to address changes that are needed to improve our food safety system. We support many of the proposals in the draft by emphasizing the need to have preventative measures be the foundation on which the food safety system should be built. The draft also recognized that we need to focus on the majority of resources on facilities and products that pose the greatest risk of contamination that could result in foodborne illness or injury. We must continue to be sure that any changes meet certain criteria, be supported by science, have measurable benefits, be affordable, be realistic, and be implemented without unintended consequences. First, we applaud you for not only designating an entire section of the bill solely to prevention, but also putting this first and the most extensive section of the bill. From our perspective, this is the appropriate emphasis. In addition, I would like to specifically comment on certain sections of the draft. FMI recognizes that a strong public-private partnership is needed to help ensure safety of the food supply. Although every penny counts in these high, tough economic times, there is nothing more important than improving and ensuring the safety of our food supply. We are willing to support a fair registration or user fee provided that it is utilized by the FDA in a transparent and accountable manner to improve the safety of our food supply through means such as conducting research and consumer education programs. We look forward to working with the committee to address our concerns about how the FDA may, may utilize any fees collected. We support the requirement that every registered food facility conduct a risk assessment and implement and maintain a validated food safety plan and identify potential resources of contamination and appropriate food safety controls and document those controls that will prevent, eliminate, and reduce potential hazards. Adherence to food safety plans goes a long way towards developing a culture within a company that is critical to ensuring food safety. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify. We appreciate the work that has gone into the development of the Food Safety Enhancement Act discussion draft with the goal of improving food safety and the food supply, and helping to restore consumer confidence in the food safety system. I look forward to your questions and remain available to the subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bailey? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. I don't know if that's on the mic. Oh, you don't have a mic. <laughs> I don't have a mic. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, I'm Pam Bailey, and I'm President and CEO of the Grocery Manufacturers Association, which represents more than 300 food, beverage, and consumer products companies. Americans enjoy one of the safest food supplies in the world, but we recognize that steps can and must be taken to make our food supplies even safer. We applaud Chairman Waxman, Chairman Emeritus Dingell, Chairman Stupak, and Chairman Pallone for developing the discussion draft of the Food Safety Enhancement Act of 2009. Product safety is the foundation of consumer trust. We look forward to working with the Quick Committee to quickly enact food safety reforms that will restore consumer confidence and will continually improve the safety of our food supply. Although the food industry is ultimately responsible for the safety of our products, strong government oversight is a critical part of our food safety system. That is why GMA supports much in the discussion draft, including your proposal to set safety standards for fruit and vegetables, your proposals to improve the safety of imported food and food ingredients, and your proposals to give FDA strong enforcement powers to deal with bad actors, including mandatory recall authority. In particular, we strongly support proposals to require all food manufacturers to conduct a hazard analysis to identify potential sources of contamination, identify appropriate pre preventive controls, and to document those preventive controls in a food safety plan. We believe that food safety plans are the cornerstone of prevention in that they will help ensure that safety is built in from the very beginning. We have proposed certain modifications to some of these provisions to your staff, and we look forward to working with you. In particular, we look forward to working with you to address your concerns about traceability. We recognize that the discussion draft instructs FDA to assess the costs, benefits, and feasibility of traceability technologies and gives FDA the power to exempt certain foods. Furthermore, we recognize that the discussion draft instructs FDA to conduct pilot projects and public meetings. However, we believe that these studies, meetings, and pilot projects should be completed before FDA decides whether and how to assign the food industry the responsibility for tracking a food product and which coding and identification systems may be best suited to this task. As you anticipate in the draft, the cost and feasibility of requiring every manufacturer to maintain the full pedigree of every ingredient in every food may outweigh the public health benefits. To address concerns raised during the peanut product recall, we urge you to consider whether intermediate distributors and brokers should include on the labeling of their bulk ingredients the identity of the ingredient supplier. In general, we support proposals to give FDA stronger enforcement powers, including the power to order a recall. We believe that certain enforcement provisions of the discussion draft, such as mandatory recall and suspension of registration, should only be exercised by senior agency officials when there is a risk of serious adverse health consequences and should ensure that companies are afforded certain due process protections, such as an administrative hearing. As we saw during the recent recalls of tomatoes and jalapeno peppers, recalls can have a devastating financial impact and they need to reflect the best science and wisest agency judgment. Finally, we strongly support efforts to provide FDA with additional resources. GMA helped create the Alliance for a Stronger FDA, and we have worked with other consumer and industry groups to increase FDA spending. If Congress enacts the FY 2010 request of the FDA and the Obama administration, we will have seen food safety spending at FDA increase by nearly 80 percent since FY 2006. More funding is needed. We look forward to working with the committee to identify an appropriate role for industry. Our industry is significantly increasing our own investments in food safety, and we are prepared to make additional investments to continually improve the safety of our food supply and to comply with many of the new mandates that are envisioned in the discussion draft. We are not opposed to all fees, and I am confident that the committee can reach a bipartisan consensus on the agency's resource needs and an appropriate role for industry. Let me close by saying again that the food and beverage industry is committed to working with you to quickly enact food safety legislation, which makes the prevention of contamination the foundation of our food safety system. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. DeWall. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for your leadership, Chairman Pallone, and also the leadership from many other members of this subcommittee and committee. And also thank you, for you to you, uh, Ranking Member Deal, for, for 
the many hearings that we've sat through, we've listened uh, to the witnesses. It's just this, is, this work has been going on before this committee for a long time, and I think uh, hopefully we are nearing an end. Uh, my name is Caroline Smith-Dewall, Director of Food Safety for the Center for Science in the Public Interest, but today I am representing 10 consumer public health and victims' advocacy organizations uh, that are members of the Safe Food Coalition. Let me begin by saying that we believe this is a strong bill that will imp improve food safety. It requires food companies to build into their processes uh, the conduct of regular hazard analysis, and they have to institute preventive controls to prevent problems from occurring. It provides a modern framework for food safety oversight to replace the antiquated food safety laws that have hamstrung the Food and Drug Administration. It gives FDA essential new authority to carry out the mission of preventing illnesses and outbreaks and to inspect food plants much more frequently. And it addresses the funding issues urgently needed uh, to, it, to institute the program improvements, doing this with a modest registration fee. The heart of any effective reform effort lies in prevention, which is in the bill's hazard analysis and preventive controls section. The bill provides FDA with new tools like written plans and access to processing records that will allow government inspectors to review the conditions in plants over time, not just when inspectors are in the facility. We recommend additional strengthening of the bill by requiring companies or labs to report pathogens on final product samples to FDA whenever they are encountered in a facility. This would give FDA an early warning of problems and might prevent another tragedy like the outbreak linked to the Peanut Corporation of America. It is a common adage that you cannot detect what you don't inspect. Random and frequent inspection by public officials is a necessary component of an effective food safety system. This legislation divides food companies into three categories based on risks and directs FDA to inspect the facilities every six months to four years. While this is a vast improvement over FDA's existing program, we continue to believe that more frequent inspections are needed particularly of high-risk facilities. Risk-based inspection is a concept that expands across the entire spectrum of food products, not just those regulated by FDA. The registration fee, as proposed, is quite modest. And at $1,000 per facility, it should provide somewhere between $300 and $400 million in new revenue for food safety activities. Let's put this fee into context. In the Peter Pan outbreak, an av the average cost per victim reporting an illness was $2,650. And this is based on an estimate using the Economic Research Service cost calculator. So when there's an outbreak, consumers of who are affected may pay over $2,500 or more. These are individuals. So clearly, a $1,000 fee on each facility to avoid these problems is more than reasonable, especially when compared to the cost of individuals and families that you've had here before this committee testifying on, on the, uh, the severe impacts of foodborne illness. In addition, I'd just like to note that companies themselves can run, um, run advertising campaigns to promote the, their products that run into the tens and even hundreds of millions of dollars. To conclude, I just want to say that polling has shown that the public has lost confidence in the safety of food. The percentage of consumers confident in food safety fell to about 22 percent, according to the University of Minnesota's Food Industry Center. 
This legislation provides a modern framework for FDA's regulation of the food supply that will deliver many benefits to consumers, though it does start, stop short of structural reforms that we also think are essential. We appreciate your leadership and we believe that these new authorities that you're proposing will over time prevent the outbreaks and illnesses and help restore consumer confidence. Earlier this year, members of the Energy and Commerce Committee made commitments to the victims of the Peanut Corporation of America outbreak that change would come to FDA. President Obama said, at a bare minimum, we should be able to count on our government keeping our kids safe when they eat peanut butter. We urge you, Chairman, to act swiftly to finalize this legislation and to enact it. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Jones. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, recent high-profile outbreaks demonstrate the huge challenges and opportunities for improvement in the nation's food supply, inf food safety infrastructure. Laws, policies, and to be frank, philosophies developed decades ago no longer suffice to successfully meet these new demands. The legislation we're discussing today is therefore a critical step in reviving the food safety capacities of the FDA. I work in a state health department as an epidemiologist responsible for investigating foodborne diseases and in effect cleaning up the mess left when things go awry in the food safety chain. I'm excited to see that this proposed legislation addresses many of the problems that I experience firsthand in my role both investigating and helping prevent foodborne disease. Improving the traceability of food as called for in this legislation is fundamental to successfully achieving many of the other tasks described. If traceback information had been more promptly available and shared faster, I think that many of the problems associated with the recent tomato jalapeno incident could have been mitigated. And likewise, tracing peanut butter from one plant to 4,000 different commercial products would have been utterly impossible with many other types of foods. Ensuring that all foods are traceable efficiently and accurately is critical to maintaining food safety. Contamination of produce and foods which are eaten uncooked are of particular concern because consumers have less control over the safety of those foods in their own kitchens. Setting standards for pre-harvest food production starts to close a major current gap in the nation's food safety system. Suspected produce-associated illnesses are particularly difficult to investigate from both the public health and regulatory perspectives. While large food service corporations and their suppliers often have excellent quality control programs with impeccable records, many other companies don't. The portions of this bill requiring country of origin labeling, improved distribution records, and plans to regulate the safe production and harvesting of fruits and vegetables are important to help address these problems. I'm pleased to see that the agency is being encouraged to markedly increase the scrutiny of food handling entities. I'd like to emphasize the importance of basing inspections and product testing and any other interventions by the agency on sound science. The bill does have important directives to improve testing in the science base of the agency's activities. It's critical that from top to bottom, activities are more efficient and effective and not just more frequent. This bill's requirement that the agency's activities are risk-based is particularly critical. It's likely that as technology improves, the value of traditionally defined inspections will change dramatically. And I'd urge that the agency retain sufficient flexibility and authority to adapt to change as rapidly and with as few barriers as possible. I think it's important that in any discussion of the food safety system to emphasize the importance of interaction between FDA and CDC along with state and local partners. In meeting the directive to enhance the science of food safety and develop risk-based approaches. Data from CDC and its partners on things like outbreaks, disease surveillance, and attribution of human disease to specific foods will be critical. It's imperative that such data are developed and shared cooperatively to meet the needs of all the partners involved in the system. In every discussion that I've been in uh, pertaining to food safety, the importance and current inadequacy of in effective information sharing is probably the most common single topic that's raised. I'm pleased to see that ad issue addressed in this bill. Improving the technological capacity to share information will be important in accomplishing this, 
but perhaps even more important is changing the ingrained policies of not sharing information among partner agencies far beyond any logical limit, even when the failure to do so threatens the public health. To meet the mandates of this bill, FDA will have to increase interaction and coordination with state and local agencies, which will require funding and focused attention. Federal regulatory agencies frequently are prohibited from sharing proprietary information obtained during investigations. Flow of information in both directions between FDA and CDC as well as state public health partners is critical. Examples of this include such things as distribution lists during recalls, information on suspected products or producers, and information on potentially exposed people. The FDA, CDC, and other partner agencies must have both the authority and expectation to share actionable information with the public health partners to the extent necessary to protect the public's health. And I'll conclude with a final comment about the importance of ensuring FDA and its, that its, and its state and local partners have adequate resources to meet the responsibilities with which they are charged in this bill. No one would argue that the FDA is currently underfunded, overworked, and essentially overwhelmed. State and local food safety capacity must also be robust in order to maintain an effective food safety system. Adequate and consistent funding and resources must be dedicated explicitly to sustain the food safety programs at FDA, as well as the state and local partners who work with them to keep the food supply safe. Americans will eat a billion meals today, and I can't think of a better investment than one that will keep every one of those meals safe. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Mr. Stenzel. Good afternoon, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Deal, and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be with you. As you know, that the fresh produce industry has been a leading proponent of strong federal government oversight of food safety. My name is Tom Stenzel. I'm President and CEO of the United Fresh Produce Association. Our organization has been privileged to testify 10 times in the last two years before this committee or other members of Congress perhaps only um, runner-up to Caroline on this panel. <laughs> Our Board of Directors in January 2007 adopted a series of policy principles calling for mandatory science-based regulation by the federal government. Today we congratulate you and the leadership of the full committee in presenting the draft of the Food Safety Enhancement Act of 2009 for consideration. While my written statement contains a number of suggestions for strengthening the bill, I will focus just now on three key areas of concern. Let me start by repeating those policy principles I mentioned. To protect public health and ensure consumer confidence, produce safety standards must allow for a commodity-specific approach based on the best available science, must be consistent and applicable to the identified commodity no matter whether it was grown in the United States or imported and it must be federally mandated with sufficient federal oversight of compliance in order to be credible to consumers. We are pleased that these principles are recognized in the draft Food Safety Enhancement Act. In looking specifically at the draft, we strongly support the bill's intent in Section 104 for FDA to focus on maximizing public health by implementing regulatory standards for those specific raw agricultural commodities that it believes are most critical. The FDA has estimated that only five commodities have been associated with 80 percent of all produce-related foodborne disease outbreaks in the past 10 years, and that is where we must direct our resources. In a highly diverse industry that is more aptly described as hundreds of different commodity industries, one size does not fit all. We support Congress specifying that FDA have broad authority to regulate any produce commodities it determines necessary but with the clear mandate to develop rulemaking that focuses resources for maximum public health benefit on those specific types of commodities for which the Secretary determines that such standards are necessary to minimize the risk of serious adverse health consequences. We also recommend that Section 104 strengthen the support for collaboration between HHS and the U.S. Department of Agriculture and all state agencies in all areas of education, research, and enforcement with regard to produce. It is important that we bring the broadest knowledge and resource base possible to assist all stakeholders in understanding and complying with FDA-set public health standards. Dealing with Section 107 on traceability, I want to assure the Committee that the fresh produce industry is committed to farm-to-fork traceability of our products. As I presented in detailed testimony before the House Committee on Appropriations, uh, Chairwoman DeLaro's Ag Subcommittee this, earlier this year, we have underway a produce traceability initiative 
to provide electronic traceability for 6 billion cases of fresh produce that move annually within the United States. This is a massive and extremely expensive long-term undertaking, but it's a commitment that we've made. However, we are concerned that the prescriptive nature of Section 107 could actually derail these important efforts to bring the most cost-efficient and cost-effective technology to bear on this challenge. As you weigh various traceability provisions, we urge that Congress set the goal, the mandate for food traceability, but not overly prescriptive requirements such as those in this bill. Rather, we believe Congress would be more effective in mandating an intensive evaluation of technologies, systems, and pilot tests that will truly lead to the end result we all desire. To that point, this legislation should set a goal for total supply chain traceability across the food industry, not single out individual food categories for traceability. Finally, on the question of imports, I believe the committee should carefully examine all of the provisions regulating imported foods to assure equal treatment and fair standards for imported and domestically produced foods. This should be a principle maintained throughout all provisions. In Section 201, we support the bill's intent to require importers to register with FDA and comply with good importer practices. The committee should make clear that this is the standard protocol for importing foods and that the limitations and restrictions envisioned in Section 109 provide very extreme authorities to be used by FDA only in worst case scenarios when required to minimize the risk of severe adverse health consequences. With regard to imports, we also strongly support the concept of the Safe and Secure Food Importation Program in Section 113 and urge that the bill require FDA to implement such a program with clear direction that it shall be implemented rather than may be implemented. Finally, let me mention 143 and country of origin labeling. The fresh produce industry is already required under the 2008 Farm Bill to provide mandatory country of origin labeling at retail point of sale. Our industry has moved rapidly to ensure compliance with this law and urges that those products which are already covered be specifically exempted from any new duplicative coverage under the FD&C Act. Let me conclude with a comment about public health. The very Department of Health and Human Services that regulates our safety has the dual responsibility to promote public health, but consider the fact that we need, as Americans, to double our consumption of fruits and vegetables to meet the very simple U.S. dietary guidelines. With that public health imperative, fears of food safety have no place in the Fresh Produce Department. Thank you for your leadership on this effort. Thank you, and thank all of you. We'll now take questions from the panel, five minutes each, and I'll start. Um, I wanted to start with Mr. Wall. Um, there are many in the industry um, have, have called for prevention. Uh, well, I should say a stronger emphasis on prevention. Uh, and many feel that we need to share the responsibility for making food safe. The FDA obviously does an important job, but manufacturers must also be responsible for the foods that they make. And one of the ways the draft before us proposes to do this is through a new emphasis on prevention. It requires companies to conduct hazard analysis to identify potential safety risks for the food they handle. It then requires that the facility owner adopt preventive measures to reduce or eliminate these risks. So Mr. Wall, can you elaborate on how preventive controls such as those put forth by the bill will help uh, make food safer? And could you give us some examples of preventive controls and how they might be implemented or applied? Thank you, Chairman Pallone. We, um, the, the systems that are going to be applied in this bill are well tested. Uh, we have watched the implementation of what are called HACCP or hazard analysis critical control point systems in the seafood industry, in the beef and poultry industries, and in the, uh, it, also in fresh juice and some, several other industries. The problem with the approach that FDA has been taking up until now and the, the solution that your bill will bring to the agency is that they have been trying to apply these systems 
uh, one by one, industry by industry. And I think what you see here is, is a, a uni, uh, unitary view among industry and consumer organizations that these systems are needed across the board. They're developed by the industry, they're driven by the industry, they design the programs, but the government can use them to actually go in and conduct inspections which are much more meaningful than the ones they do today. Well, let me ask each of you, I'll ask Ms. Bailey and then go to the others quickly, uh, if you would respond, whether you support these preventive approaches to food safety. Absolutely, yes, sir. Okay, Mike or yes. Dr. Jones? Yes, sir, we do. All right, great. Um, I mean, obviously, we got a consensus on the preventative approach being a critical part of the bill. I, I wanted to ask um, about access to records, though, too. One of the new requirements in the bill um, references access to records. Section 106 requires that food manufacturers and producers retain records relating to the foods they produce and, upon request, provide these records to the FDA. FDA would, in, in the event of a foodborne disease outbreak or during an inspection, have access to information on how foods were produced, manufactured, transported, or stored. And I'll, I'll initially ask Dr. Jones, can you describe for us how this type of records access would be helpful to the FDA in the event of a foodborne disease outbreak? Well, I, I mean, I think access to those r records are critical in order for them to sort of pinpoint their um, interventions, but I also think the ability for FDA to share uh, that data with other agencies that assist them uh, in those investigations is critical. And that's been a huge barrier for us. I mean, I've worked on outbreaks where FDA had the names and phone numbers of people that had consumed contaminated product and would not or thought that they could not share that information with public health departments that are responsible for calling those people and telling them not to eat the stuff. Uh, and that's just mind-boggling to me. Uh, I, I mean, I think it, it's subtle, but there's some addressing that issue in this bill. Um, you want to comment also, Ms. DeWall, on, on um, whether you believe that this access to records provision will help protect public health? The access to records provision gives the agency the ability to look at plants. When they visit them, they can look at them as they're operating over time. Today, when an FDA inspector goes into a plant, they just see the four walls of the plant. Uh, they may not even get access to any records in that facility. Um, they can look at production practices as they're happening on that day. But with the access to records provision together with these, this preventive control system and this written food safety plan, the, the inspector will be able to go and look back at where the company has faced perhaps challenges in its operation and how they've addressed them. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I don't know if anybody else wanted to address it, but I think that's fine. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Deal. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tinsel, I guess I'm going to start with you um, from the producer side of it. First of all, in a general context, uh, do you see any problem or potential of this legislation creating overlaps with FDA jurisdiction and requirements to do things versus current USDA requirements to do things uh, in our food supply? We don't see any uh, jurisdictional issues in, in public health in that sense. FDA has the statutory authority now uh, to regulate uh, the fresh produce industry. Uh, we do suggest strongly that uh, there be a good coordination uh, with the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, in education, enforcement. Certainly one of the keys to implementing this bill is going to be uh, an effective structure with FDA working with USDA and state and local agencies in compliance, enforcement, inspections. That needs to be uh, strengthened, but uh, there's not a jurisdictional issue of uh, competing authorities. My understanding is that at the production level uh, that good agricultural practices are the primary preventive tool and mechanism for dealing with it at the production level. Um, do you see perhaps that uh, an updating or improvement on those agricultural practices standards as they apply to uh, fruits and vegetables uh, is important and is there anything here that would prevent that from taking place? 
Uh, yes, sir, uh, Mr. Deal, that is an extremely important part. Uh, the FDA's good agricultural practices are called to be updated in this draft legislation. Uh, we strongly support that as the baseline guidance for all fruits and vegetables. Uh, for those specific commodities in which FDA has determined a significant level of risk, then you move into the rulemaking procedure. But uh, that is one of the key things. It is the way we can best focus our public health resources on the greatest risk. Uh, I said in my testimony that uh, 80 percent of all the outbreaks have been associated with just five commodities. So the basic good agricultural practices are, are very appropriate for all fruits and vegetables. But let's focus the rulemaking on those specific commodities that require it. And Ms. Bailey, I believe you made the point that uh, since we have uh, mandated uh, studies and pilot projects, et cetera, that those be completed before we start trying to write the rules and regulations. Is that one of the points you were making? On traceability, yes. Yes. Um, it seems to me that if we're going to do the studies and the pilot projects, we ought to do that before we write the regulations because presumably they will give us the information to guide us in the rulemaking process. So I, I think your point is well made. In that regard, Mr. Stencil, uh, your industry has already put in place some traceability um, uh, standards. Uh, how do you see your current uh, efforts in traceability, uh, how do they correspond to what is in this legislation? I tell you, this is uh, proving to be a massive, massive undertaking. And um, we, we are committed to doing it, even on a voluntary basis before any type of requirement. But extremely complex system of, of creating that interoperable system uh, that can see the life cycle all the way through of our products. Uh, but some of the, the specific uh, language in this bill, uh, the full pedigree uh, of each product, uh, gives us great cause for concern, even though we are moving down a path of hundreds of millions of dollars being invested in interoperable traceability systems, we don't think they might meet exactly the terms of this bill. So we would also strongly advise that FDA uh, be mandated to get involved in the, the technology, in the pilot test, learn about each industry. Uh, and then write the regulation. Uh, it, it's premature to, to tell every industry exactly how it should be done until we have this greater learning. Um, one of the uh, scares that we've alluded to here was the Mexican pepper scare that uh, adversely impacted the tomato industry. Um, and I guess I would ask you again, how, how do we ensure that foreign producers uh, meet the kind of standards that we would need uh, would it require, in your opinion, some kind of foreign uh, producer verification system of some sort? Well, I think the, uh, the requirements in the import section are appropriate, that importers will now be required to register with FDA, and as part of give good importer practices, they will have to uh, assure that their products have been grown in accordance with these standards. Uh, we believe that is an appropriate step uh, to be taken. Uh, I don't think anyone envisions going um, searching around on every farm around the world uh, nor every farm in America, to be honest with that. Uh, that is simply not going to be the case. The authority should be there for FDA if they need to uh, investigate an issue, but uh, the basic uh, responsibility is going to lie with the importer or the food manufacturer. Yes or no. uh, does your organization represent the organics uh, producers? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we have a number of organic suppliers uh, in our group. Thank you. Would you entertain this? Um, I have a statement, and I think we've cleared it with your staff uh, from the Frozen Food Institute to be inserted in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Chairman Dingell. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'd like to commend the panel for their very helpful testimony and thank you all. I'd, like, I'd particularly like to address my questions, however, to Ms. Bailey from GMA. I'd like to first begin by welcoming you. I'd like to follow up by thanking you for the cooperative way in which you and GMA have been working with the staff to try and resolve the difficulties which we confront. And I'd like to also express my particular thanks to you for the most helpful way in which you have behaved and the remarkable change uh, that has occurred under your leadership. So I thank you. Uh, first of all, Am I fair in stating that FDA has been so underfunded that they have not been able to provide the necessary services to protect either the industry or the consumers for a number of years? That is right. 
and as a result, they have been unable to adequately fulfill their role in ensuring the safety of the nation's food supply. Yes, <coughs> we would agree. Uh, the, unfortunately, our reporter doesn't have a nod. You've got to say oh, yes sorry. or no. I, I, say, I said yes. And if I could give an example, um, FDA I, has not been able to update good manufacturing practices since 1986. And that's just one example of something they've not been able to do without adequate resources. Now that sounds like a very serious matter. Tell us what that means. Well, good manufacturing practices serve the basis those are required both in food and drug, cosmetics, and That's also right. and there, uh, in, in, in pharmaceuticals. That's right. And so the preventive controls that we're talking about, and HACCP, for example, are one step up from good manufacturing practices. You want to have them updated. And as we all know, there have been enormous advances in manufacturing and food processing since 1986 relating to pathogen control, environmental testing, all of the, the advancements, and FDA has not been able to incorporate them into updated good manufacturing practices guidance for industry. Would you also agree that FDA's science base has eroded? Absolutely, yes. And that the FDA's information technology systems are inadequate? Yes. And that FDA has not been doing an acceptable level of surveillance and research? That's right. Uh, would you agree that they have not conducted a satisfactory number of inspections over the years? Uh, this figure I got, with, which seems interesting, FDA conducted 6,562 domestic food facility inspections in 2008, 152 foreign food facility inspections in 2008. The total number of registered facilities is 378,000, but there are many more out there in the world who are shipping stuff to us. Is that a fair statement? That's an accurate statement, yes. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure you, you, you agree, as you have said in your statement, that FDA needs additional resources to do their job. Yes. And uh, you, I want to commend you very much for the way you've been working with us on the registration and the fee question. And I want you to know that we're going to try very hard to see to it that we come up with something that enables industry to work, prosper, achieve, a, have a satisfactory Food and Drug Administration, uh, one which protects the consumers, but also which doesn't overburden the industry. And we look forward to continuing your, our efforts on that, and I hope that you will, you will continue to give us those assistances. Um, and again, the reporter has no nod button. Yes. Yes, we look forward to that. Um, I thought that Dr. Hamburg this morning um, uh, laid good grant, uh, a good basis for those discussions going forward. Uh, I'm troubled about foreign people who deliver food into the United States. Food and Drug doesn't have the right number of inspections at, and, and inspectors at the border, do they? No, that's right. They do not. Uh, I'm told they only inspect about 1% of the foods coming into the United States. And that games are played oftentimes where they're turned back, uh, rather where food shipments are turned back with the result that they go out and come in another port. Are you troubled about that? Yes, we need strong inspections at the border. Now, I'm also troubled about the fact that Food and Drug has no understandings with their sister agencies, with uh, customs, with immigration. So as a result, a lot of times their inspectors will be at the ports and there's no Food and Drug folk there. We ought to, we ought to see to it that there's a cooperative agreement there to make that, make that possible so that they would work together instead of ignoring each other's business. Isn't that right? I think that sounds like a good idea. Yes, sir. Well, I note that I am three seconds over time. It's a pleasure to have you before us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dingell. Thank you, Chairman Dingell. Um, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I've got a lot of questions. I'm going to try to be uh, quick. You all were sat in the uh, first testimony. Uh, can any of you tell me what may cause means? Let's do Mr. Ambrosio. Do you know what may cause means? Uh, it's a it's a very vague term. Okay, Miss Bailey, may cause. Um, I'm not certain. No. Okay, Miss Dewall. 
Thank you. Um, the actual subsection says, if the secretary has reason to believe that the use or consumption of or exposure to an article of food may cause adverse health consequences. So the actual standard, sir, is reason to believe. And the may cause is, is in there, but it, it really is, is a standard which is very protective of public health. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jones. Uh, I agree with those comments. Uh, and Mr. Stencil. Uh, I believe that it, it's a much more vague standard than that. And, and, I, and I hope we can work to, to, to clean up that language, and I think there's an opportunity to do that. Let me ask this uh, subpoena question again uh, to those who may want to talk about uh, that. Um, there are three criteria in Section 311 which I didn't allude to the first. First is any hearing, investigation, and other proceedings respecting a violation of the Act. I think most people agree, oh, subpoena. Any hearing, investigation, or other proceeding to determine if a person is in violation of specific provisions of this Act. Um, I, I think an average person would say, okay, subpoena these babies. Um, the third one, any other matter relative to the commissioner's jurisdiction under this Act the Public Health Service Act and the Federal Anti-Tampering Act. Any other matter, vague or not? Mr. Ambrosio? It's vague. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Bailey? Yes, that it's vague. Mr. Wall? Actually, these acts are important to protect us against swine flu, against so bioterrorism. So, in, in fact, these acts, if, if you understand the relationship between the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and these other um, legal statutes, I, I think the language may be appropriate. But it we'll, may be. It may not, we'll may not be. We'll go back it may and look be. at it. Okay, thanks. Dr. Jones? I'm a physician, not a lawyer. Okay. Uh, Neither am I, but I <laughs> pretend to be one here. Uh, but you know, it, so my tendency is to err uh, on the side of protecting the public's health. But I agree, it's somewhat vague. My my tendency is to question the legal language of the law that may heart, harm folks by uh, the language. I've found the language of the law is very important, and uh, interesting things can be done as this gets crafted. Uh, Mr. Stencil. Um, I think it's also quite a, a general standard and, and do suggest it's an area to look at um, throughout the bill. Thank you. Let me go, Mr. Stentz, I want to ask specifically on Section 104, which calls for the Secretary to issue regulation on produce safety standards. The language in the bill says a standard may include minimum standards for safety. This, this is a lot of this, the language stuff that I've been focusing on today. Why would we want the agency to issue minimum standards instead of the appropriate standards for safety? Mr. Shimkus, thank you for raising that. Uh, it's actually a subject I addressed in my written testimony. I don't think we should be using such terms as minimum or expecting minimum standards. We should have the agency uh, write the, the standards that are most appropriate that all uh, produ producers should follow. Um, I can tell you this, that as soon as we have minimum standards, the first thing that's going to happen is someone's going to say that's not good enough. So, so if we're going to go down this path, let's make sure the agency writes the most appropriate standards. And that's that whole debate that we always have up here about some certainty. Yes. Industry needs certainty. If we have vague language, there is uncertainty. And with uncertainty comes higher risk because of trying to comply. Um, that's, that's, okay, I appreciate that. Let me, uh, Ms. Bailey, what was surprising in the draft is, and, and I was on ONI last Congress, I can't talk about what was the hearings in previous Congresses or what's going on this time, but um, baby formula has popped into this debate. Um, and I know of no hearings on baby formula in the last Congress when I was ranking on ONI. Um, have there been any reported problems that would suggest that there needs to be a reason to change the way infant formula is regulated? Uh, and the premise is it's highly regulated already. Can you want to comment on that? Yes. Um, we are not familiar either with the origin of that provision. We noticed it in this draft, um, and we are, of course, aware of how highly regu regulated baby formula is. Um, and we are interested in receiving further information. But um, it obviously is very important, as is the, the safety of the product and the availability to, to mothers and children. 
And thank you, Chairman. My, my time's expired. I would have gone on with uh, a pilot program. I think that's been discussed a little bit. I know Mr. Ambrosio has some comments, and I think a pilot program might be important, and I yield back. What do you want to do? I don't know. Do you want to ask her? It's Diana's. Ask her. Why don't you go talk to her a second? The problem that we have is there is an important vote in our other subcommittee. So I'd like to adjourn for just five minutes so that the members can go and vote in the other subcommittee and we'll come right back. So the subcommittee, if you bear with us, just in recess for five minutes. Coming up on C-SPAN 2, a ceremony to unveil a new statue of President Ronald Reagan at the Capitol. After that,